My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Wednesday, October 18th, 2017. I'm here with Robert Goldenberg at his home in Princeton, New Jersey, and we're going to record the second part of our interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Bob, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. Great. So as you know, last spring we started our interview, talked a lot about um, your experiences in the Chavara, in the New York Chavara, and uh, some of the ways in which it had played out in your own life and um, in the larger Jewish community in America. So today we'd like to go back and start by providing some background on you and your early life and what led you uh, to your uh, experiences in the, in the New York Chavara. Right. So let's begin with your family when you were growing up. All right. You were born in 1942? I was, that's in correct. Brooklyn. In okay. Brooklyn. You described your family as a standard issue Ashkenazi immigrants to the U.S. Can you tell us briefly about your family? Was yes. Um, by the time I was, at around the time that I was born, my grandmother, my mother's mother came to live with us. So we were a household of my parents and my grandmother and me, and then my sister was born some years later. My parents were both school teachers in the New York City system. Where had they grown up? They had grown up in Brooklyn. My mother lived into her 90s and never did not live in Brooklyn. Um, my grandmother uh, had come from the old country, from Minsk. She was already married there. My grand, her husband, my grandfather, had passed away very shortly before I was born. I'm named after him. Um, she couldn't read or write. She was in other ways very competent and she could read numbers so that she could go shopping, which she did every day. It was her way to get out. Um, but she couldn't read or write. My parents were both college graduates and at least my mother and maybe my father as well, I don't remember, had a master's <laughs> degree. So that they represented the kind of standard dramatic upward mobility of families of that kind. What was your mother's master's degree in? Science. She was a biology major, though she spent her career teaching what were then called retarded children, now special ed kids. My father was a high school math teacher. Um, our home, you know, was unambiguously Jewish. I don't think my parents had a single non-Jewish close friend, although they had plenty of non-Jewish colleagues at work with whom they got along pretty well. The home was kosher. My parents did not keep kosher out of the home. I always suspected that was on behalf of my grandmother who had come to live with us, but my mother vehemently denied that. My father was pretty clearly indifferent to the whole thing. He wouldn't have cared one way or the other, but my mother really did have a, a kind of sentimental attachment to Jewish tradition, although she in her own life was not very traditional. Um, so that's how we grew up. They belonged to a conservative synagogue, one of the... What was the neighborhood like? Where you? It was a Jewish were... neighborhood, though not overwhelmingly so. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of Gentiles in the building, even in the apartment house where we lived. What part of Brooklyn was this? Uh, I grew up across the street from Kings County Hospital in what I guess was called Flatbush. Um, so can you describe the the ethnic composition, the religious composition of the, the neighborhood? The neighborhood had many, 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 many Jews, as I say, although not only Jews. There was an Orthodox synagogue not far away. I knew, I knew a couple of Orthodox families, but we were distinctly non-Orthodox, and none of my parents was observant at all. My parents' friends, sorry, was observant at all. So it was a highly assimilated, but unambiguously Jewishly ethnic world in which I moved. In Easy. my public school, here's one more, I don't think I ever had, and classes were large, this was the public system, I don't think I ever had more than three non-Jewish kids in any of my classes until maybe not even in junior high or in high school. Okay. So that gives you a sense of that, although I can be more detailed if you want me to. No, that's good. That's okay. Good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had that kind of background. My parents, my grandmother who lived with us kept Shabbat at home, but she relied on my parents to do all the things that at another time and place a Shabbos guy would have done. 
Such as what? Oh, turn on the lights, cook something. My parents made no pretense of being Sabbath observers. So your mother would cook on Shabbat, for instance? As I recall. If I'm doing her an injustice, I, I apologize to her wherever she may be. Um, but as I recall, that's correct. And, and they belonged to a large conservative synagogue, which they never attended. But they sent me to Hebrew school there. This was the Brooklyn Jewish Center on Eastern Parkway. When you say they never attended, was that literally so? Did they not go, for instance, for the high holidays? That's correct. No, so not at all? Not, not at all. In later years, because of the turn that my life had taken, my mother began to go from time to time. My grandmother went on the high holidays and to say Yizker. I don't remember whether she went more often than that either. After all, she couldn't read the prayer book. And when my mother started going to Yizker, my father had no inclination to join her. But then at later years, still, she bought him a talus and made him come with her on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So he went. He was very compliant in that way. If she wanted him to go, he went. He sat there. It was not uninteresting to him, but as an outside observer. And that's how I grew up. There, there was no real recognition, other than the kashrut of the home, of Jewish. I know we lit, we lit Hanukkah candles on Yom Kippur, which when my parents did fast, suddenly they didn't turn on any lights. They plugged in a few uh, night lights, and on Yom Kippur, and only Yom Kippur, suddenly they were doing all these things. We had no real Seder till I got old enough to make one, which means 10 years old. And what happened then? Then yeah, I presided over, you know, because I wanted it. I had probably learned in Hebrew school that I should want it. And, you know, they had copies of the Maxwell House Haggadah or something like that. So I, I read through parts of it. I was going to read through every word until my parents told me, no, you can't do that. That's going to take forever. So, you know, I presided over the family Seder from then on, without break, until, until I had no family left except my own nuclear family. Yeah. So I became, as it were, the, the, the rabbinic authority in the family. And all this was from an early age. Um, it was, indeed. You, you were a small child during uh, World War II. I was younger than a small child. I was born during the war, but I had no awareness of it at all. No awareness? None at all. Do you remember a time when you did become aware of the war? Of the no, Holocaust? actually I did not. Uh, my parents, all of my grandparents, and many and well, and many of their siblings were already in America before World War One. And although there may have been a conspiracy of silence going on, it may also well be that there were no close relatives of mine left in Europe when the Second World War began, because it never got talked about. But I also never had a sense that something wasn't being talked about. The first public event that I remember, I don't remember President Roosevelt dying either, although I do remember President Truman. The first public event that I noticed, the, the, the little you know, Jewish calendar for 1948 had a whole page about a Jewish state, and I had no idea what any of that was about, but I remember noticing it. You were like five or six. I was, in May of 1948, I was five and a half. Right. So you do have a slight recollection. Well, I, that, and I was reading. I could read from a young age, so that I found this thing and I read it. Do you remember any conversation? No, I don't. I was because I, I don't remember discussing it with anybody. My parents, in that way, were not, they and their friends were ethnically Jewish, as I've said, but generally speaking, there's one exception to that, but there's always an exception to anything. Generally speaking, we're not interested in Jewish things. So that their conversation, which I would overhear all the time, was not about such matters. Huh. What was the conversation about? Oh, professional thing. They were all school teachers, so they had plenty to talk about the Board of Ed and, and local politics. 
Um, the men all played golf, so they could talk about that. Um, and just, you know, things transpiring in their lives. Everybody was raising children, so there were always stories about that. That's what I remember, anyway. You know, it's a long time ago, but that's what I remember. Yeah. So all of their friends were sort of these secular, yes, ethnically that's right. that's identified right. Jews. That's right. They were all, as my father-in-law in later years said, they were all workman circle Jews. Without, they were all leftists. I mean, workman circle is, you know, overtly leftist. They were not so political either. But, they, you know, they were all the kinds of people who, you know, voted Democratic. My parents were registered in the Liberal Party until I talked them out of that on the grounds that in New York City what really mattered was the primary. They really should be registered Democrats. So they changed their registration. Excuse me. <coughs> um, right. So that's how I grew up. When you say Workman Circle... Um, Jews. <clears throat> yes. Were they actually members of Workman Circle? I don't think so. My father, for a while, was a member of B'nai B'rith. Um, no, Workman Circle. He, my father-in-law, just meant, you know, politically liberal, not religious. Uh, at home with Yiddish things, which my parents were. My grandmother lived, as I said, with us. My parents and she spoke to one another in Yiddish. My father said. Um, in later years, that he learned English when he started going to public school. I don't know if that's really true. It's a little hard to imagine. He hadn't already learned English on the street, but that's what he said. Um, so you grew up hearing Yiddish all the time? Oh, I could speak Yiddish then. Did they speak to you in Yiddish? No, but I learned how to speak Yiddish by listening to them. Um, no, they made no effort. Oh, it's interesting. There was, a, but according to legend, there was a fight between my two grandmothers when I was born. One said, well, of course you'll teach him Yiddish. And the other said, why would we do that? We're in America now. And they had a big argument about it. And which was the one who lived in your house? The one who was not a Yiddishist. My other grandmother, who was also widowed by the time I was not very old, uh, could read and especially read the Yiddish newspaper every day. So she was better informed. And she read the favorites, the, the leftist newspaper. She wouldn't go near the right wing newspaper. Um, so, right, I don't think either of them made any particular effort to speak to me in Yiddish, but I was growing up in a house where these were the, what kind of, the dimensions of our identity. Were your parents concerned with being American? Not overtly, not consciously. They, you know, we just took all that for granted. I mean, it wasn't one of the homes one hears about this kind of thing, where there was deep and overt gratitude for being an American. None of that. They just were American. Uh, we did not own an American flag. I asked my father, how come we don't have any? He said, gave a kind of answer like, I don't know. I just, we just never felt the need to buy one. Did anybody in your family fight in the Second World War? My father did. He was in the Pacific for several years. Um, I don't know of anyone else who did, but I was young enough that I might have been oblivious to all that. I do remember his coming home. Um, so how old were you? I w when he came home, I was probably between three and a half and four. I don't remember exactly when it was that he came home. You hadn't seen him until that point that you recall? Mm, I don't know the answer to that. But you don't recall seeing it. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's, he wasn't shipped out until after I was born, but I don't know how old I was when he was shipped out. Um, <clears throat> what do you remember about his homecoming? People were glad to see him. It, it wasn't very festive. It was People were glad to see him. And, you know, that's all I can tell you, really. It wasn't an event that burned itself into my memory. I don't think there was a big, I don't remember that there was a big party or anything like that. Um, so then I was going to Hebrew school at this conservative synagogue. This is the East Midway. No, that was the Brooklyn Jewish Center. And then we moved when I was 13 okay. into the neighborhood of the East Midwood Jewish Center, which in many ways was the same kind of synagogue, one of the largest, I call them conservative cathedrals of Brooklyn. I joined the teenage 
youth group. Go back for a minute. What had so, been your Jewish education up to that point? Hebrew school, standard three days a week Hebrew school. Starting in? Start, starting probably in first or second grade. Okay. Uh, and I took to it. I enjoyed it. Um, I found it interesting. But I don't think I showed at that early point any sign of what would turn out to be the direction of my life. Then we moved to the East Midwood area and I became active in what they called the Young People's Synagogue, which met on Saturday morning. Uh, and it was largely a self-directed group of teenagers and was my first experience, this is already a foreshadowing of the Chavra, my first experience of belonging to a Jewish community which is a freestanding, self-governing group which became my model of Jewish life. I never became very tolerant of belonging to large synagogues. Uh, and I had a whole succession of these things. Uh, the big influence on me, which was the direct result of my belonging to this teen synagogue group, was going to Camp Ramah. I just, I you want to get to that later? One sec. I want to ask a little bit more about your synagogue experience. Sure. One question I have is, what drew you to this? You, you had not grown up in a family oh, that was involved. I don't, I've never known the answer to that, although you can imagine that I've thought about it a lot. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. It, there was tension between my mother and her mother, always, uh, which is not so unusual in Jewish families of a certain kind. And I've always wondered whether I became very interested in a much more traditional Jewish perspective as a kind of taking sides with my grandmother against my mother, which would not be psychologically implausible, though I never explored that in therapy or anything like that. It's Were your parents supportive of your growing interest in Jewish? My, my father things? figured, my father, as I've said before, was not interested in such matters. If that's what I wanted, fine. Um, my mother, one of the things she said about me when I suddenly began to become much more observant, one of the things she said about me to me was that I'm just worried that you'll be saddled with guilt when you abandon this. Which is, when might be too strong. She might have said if, though I remember it as having, her having said when. Um, whether she was confident that it was just as parents always said a phase, or whether she just was actually worried about what she said, that I was committing myself to something that would be very hard to uncommit to if I ever decided to do that. And it's true, by the way, that one of the features of my personality is that once I undertake something, it's very hard for me to say, that's enough, I'm done with this now. So I do wind up sometimes committed to things long after I've lost any real desire to be part of them. So she may have known that about me and been concerned, though she was wrong. Over the course of, it's been many years now, I've become less observant, more observant, and it's never been labeled with guilt. I'll, uh, labeled is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Um, so she was right about that, but then at the same time, several years later when I went to the rabbinical school at JTS, she began to feel that she had to behave in a way that was suitable for the mother of a rabbinical school. That's when she started going to shul more often. That's when she started to pressure my father. To That's when she stopped going to work on Yom Tov. My parents had always gone to work, not on the high holidays, but on the other Jewish holidays. My father continued, my mother stopped. Fascinating. So you... Uh, continued through, uh, your education continued through high school, is that right? My Jewish, Jewish, education. Jewish education? Yes, because the East Midwood had a high school development, not development, not department. It continued program. its supplementary school th program through high school. Had you had a bar mitzvah? Yes, uh, again a standard bar mitzvah. What was a standard bar mitzvah in those yeah, days? I, I, I learned to read the Haftorah. Did you learn the trope or how did you learn it? I learned the trope. I did not learn how to read the Torah, which is what Bamrets for kids now all learn, till years later. I learned, you know, I read the Haftarah. Um, I'm sure the rabbi gave us some speech to me that I don't remember at all. And then we had a party in the house, not one of these big lavish things, just my parents brought in some deli, 
and invited whomever they invited, I don't know. Um, so it came and went. It was not a memorable, well, no, it was not a fancy occasion. And, yeah, go ahead. What am I skipping by that you want to... No, that's good. So, I, so you, dis, you un, did you continue because you were interested? Yes. My parents, my parents were not pressuring me to do any of this. They would have accepted my decision to abandon it, as my mother thought that I would someday. Right. Um, no, it was all fine with them, but it was all my idea. So you were starting to say that you... Um, Some of my friends from that group are still my friends. Go ahead. That your um, the team group that yes. that met. Yes. And you were very active in that. Yes, I was. Tell us a little bit about that experience. <sighs> well, we had services every Saturday morning, which we planned, which we led, um, which we. Most of us were also in this high school supplementary school, so we saw each other repeatedly over the week. Um, this was really your social group. This was really my social group. Though I had other, you know, secular Jewish friends in high school and in junior high, but this was my neighborhood social group. And, you know, we, we, we reinforced each other's interest in and commitment to Jewish involvement. Of those people, you know, several became professors of Jewish studies, several became Jewish educators. It was a program that actually bore the kind of fruit that every educator wants a program like that to bear. Um, and the same guy who was the advisor to the group also was the head counselor at Camp Rama. He's the one who recruited Arye Rohn was his name. Rohn? R-O-H-N in English. Um, it was a Hebrew name, really. He had gone from Europe to Israel and then to Palestine and then came to America. Um, he recruited me for Camp Ramah. And there, again, I had such a much more powerful experience of the same kind of thing. I was only a camper for one summer. I was 15 before I started going. But then I was on the staff for 10 years. And it was, again, you know, a staff of a camp runs the place. It, it does... Every, it makes decisions, it organizes programs. Uh, and my peer group were these people, many of whom are also still my friends. Um, so I was having the repeated experience of belonging to a small Jewish group of people my own age who were inventing our Jewish lives together. Which Ramah did you go to? Poconos. Tell us a little bit about what that camp experience was like. And well, what how it impacted you, given where you were in I, I your knew, life at that point. I knew at once that it had had a very strong impact on me, although, again, I didn't know how to think about it, really, so that I've never really been able to account to myself of why it had such a strong impact, right? I came home from that one summer determined to keep Shabbat, determined to keep kosher out of the house, and my parents, you know, who found some of that inconvenient, just allowed it to happen. They were not going to get in the way of my becoming what I wanted to become. So, yeah, so that was the impact that had on me. That is to say, I can describe it, but I can't really explain it. Was this um, a singular experience of Shabbat, for instance, for you? Had you had experiences that were similar to the kinds uh, of Shabbats one would have at Ramah? I might have gone to a couple of USY weekends. Uh -huh. um, what do you remember about Shabbat at <coughs> Ramah, for instance? Uh, just that there was a feeling that it was special, <coughs> that it was programmed in such a way that it was enjoyable, that it was, in fact, the Shabbat is designed to be a break from what otherwise we were doing all week long. That's the answer that I can give you. You know, I, Nobody gave speeches about it. Nobody ever got up and said, see how wonderful Shabbat is in camp? You know, you can have that at home too. None of that went on. It, it, it just was there. Uh, and it had the intended effect on me. I don't know quite how else to see it. 
I mean, we also had tefillah every morning, of course, and that didn't stick on me quite so strongly. Um, but Shabbat did. The idea of keeping kosher did. Uh, of course, the camp was kosher, but that could just have been seen because it needed to feed us something. And the home that I came from was kosher, so that was less novel. What about uh, being Shomer Shabbat? What do you mean, what about? Did that stick? Did that carry over? Yes, to very you? much, very much still. I mean, um, living, by the, changed the way you living by the Jewish calendar has probably been the most consistent piece of Jewishness in my life. Um, as somebody once said, uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for holy time. Um, so I just took that on. You know, I learned how to do it better. I got more uh, skillful at making Shabbat valuable. In what way? Um, I learned how to take walks. I learned how to take naps. I learned how to make the rhythm of Shabbat different and noteworthy. Uh, but I also was among friends with whom we kept Shabbat. So on Saturday afternoon, some of that same group of people would go and hang out in somebody's house. It was, as you said, also my social group, also my uh, group of identity. I, I, I was much less reflective about a lot of these things than, than you would have hoped I would be, because I don't have more to say about them. But um, somehow I just got into this into this way of living a Jewish life, and, and it took with me. Were there particular um, counselors or leaders at the camp who had an impact on you? Uh, there were people who had an impact on me in other ways, but I didn't identify my uh, becoming interested in leading a more Jewish life with anybody. It wasn't under the influence of any individual person. I didn't feel that I was under it as, as I did that. Ismar Shorsh himself was my counselor the one year that I was a camper. Um, but, you know, he was a counselor. It didn't make the same difference to me. Anybody else could have been my counselor. Had I had some sort of jerky 19-year-old for my counselor, maybe things would have all been different. I can't speak to that. And then in later years, I became very much under the influence of Rabbi David McGilner, who was a very powerful influence over the lives of me. He was the director of Camp Armand de Poconos from the early 60s on, I mean, when I was already on the staff. And I worked closely with him, and I just admired him greatly. But by then I had made my Jewish commitments. That was all on other, in other dimensions of my life that that came to, into play. You went back to Ramah as a, sort of a, in a junior staff position? And then a age. senior staff position, right. I, I, by the time I left, I was... Um, the associate director of the counselor training program and, and also the program coordinator for the camp. Um, yeah, as I said, I was on the staff for 10 years and then I had nothing to do with Camp Ramah until my kids started going, but that was Berkshire's when the whole world was different. Yeah, indeed. So, um, you graduated from high school in 59? Correct. And went on to do your undergraduate. I went on, I, I, right, I went to Cornell. How did you decide on Cornell? Uh, it's the place that I got into, to be simple about it. Um, the only other, pl I applied to various places. I got into Cornell and Brooklyn College, and I really didn't want to go to Brooklyn College. Uh, so I went to Cornell, which was fine. I enjoyed the education that I got there, although in retrospect, it could have been a better designed education. I'm not blaming myself for that. I'm blaming the school for that. That's a whole different conversation. But once again, I became very quickly involved in the Jewish life there, which was the Hillel, where again, there was a Hillel rabbi who was Rabbi Morris Goldfarb. And he, of course, was an active guide to the group, but it was also to a very considerable extent. You know, we ran our own lives as a group. And I also became very active in what was then the Young Israel of Cornell, which is essentially the Jewish living... The Jewish what? Living house, and had the kosher kitchen. So there we were entirely on our own. We, we, we just ran our own building. Was this a, a university-sponsored 
house or I don't was know what you mean by pro no. project. Well, it was university property. It was a university owned house, and I'm sure we had to register with them in whatever way we did. And um, the university was responsible for maintenance, so that you know we were in touch with the university people constantly. But it wasn't sponsored by the university, it was only registered with the university, which is a different thing. Was it sponsored by Hillel? No, it was sponsored by the young, National Young Israel Movement, although it no longer is. It's still there and in the same building, but it's now a much more freestanding entity. And So what was it like in the days that you were there? Well, it was ostensibly orthodox, which I was not really, except maybe half the members Half the residents in the house were, in fact, Orthodox graduates of day schools and all that. The other half just liked living there. How big a group was it? A couple of dozen. And, you know, we, we had monthly meetings, we made policies. Uh, the kitchen was run by one of us, not by a, a grown-up. To run a kitchen like that is a big job. And we did all that ourselves. Um, there was some tension between the observant and the non-observant guys. Were there people there who were truly non-observant? Oh, yes. There were people there, you know, if we needed a minion, who said, don't bother me with that stuff. And so there was, uh, but who lived there for reasons that were not always easy to understand. It may have been just, well, they were not easy to understand. I'm not going to start speculating. Yeah. Um, right. And so I lived there, and I also, again, it became the kind of group in which I liked to live my kind of Jewish life. And in both the Hillel and the Young Israel, you know, I, I rose to positions of leadership. And it was a very, it, it kept it going for me. It, it reinforced what was already what you could call, you know, the, the trend of my developing life. Uh, and, and yeah. What was it like to be a Jewish student at Cornell in those years? Oh, You're talking sort of 59 right, to Right, 50 63. to 63. A couple of things are worth mentioning. First of all, to be Shomer Shabbat there was very hard because the university as a whole had no knowledge that this was going on and didn't care. I had to take a couple of classes on Saturday that were required for my major. I just sat there, you know, and listened. They didn't take notes. Um, the university as a whole was much less hospitable to overt Jewishness than universities have since become. How was that manifest? In several ways. First of all, we couldn't get the university to accept that the kosher kitchen at the Young Israel House could be brought in under the university meal plan. They just wouldn't have that. So if you ate there, you ate, you paid for it out of your own money, even and that probably meant you didn't have a meal plan, but that meant that other meals that you bought in the university cafeteria were also at the cash rate. And the university wouldn't hear of changing that. The, the university, um, here's one story. I think it was my sophomore year, the first day of classes was going to be Rosh Hashanah. So I went to one of the professors and said, I'm going to have to miss the first day of classes, Jewish holiday. Is the syllabus already available, please? And he gave me the syllabus, and then he said, well, if you can't do things our way, why are you here? If you can't? Do things our way, why are you here? So that kind of attitude, it was still acceptable to express that kind of attitude when I was a student. Now, he was, he was an old guy, and he was the old guard. I don't know if younger professors would have said that. I also had a math professor who was much younger, married to an Israeli, and understood that I didn't come to class on the first day of Yom Tov, but didn't understand why I wouldn't come to class on this. He said, even Elal flies on the second day of the holiday, he said to me. His wife was Israeli, they were secular. And they, so there wasn't a lot of readiness to be understanding of what I was trying to become. Let's put it that way. How large a community was the Jewish population of the university Overall? Overall. Do you have I, a sense of that? I, I was told 20%, although in later years I was told by somebody who knows 
most of the estimates of Jewish population on university campuses right down to today are much too high. The estimates are too high? Are too high. So maybe they weren't 20%, I just don't know. And of that, let's say, 20%, how large a group would you say were involved? Jewishly involved? Jewishly involved and also on the observant end. Oh, on the observant end? Are you talking about a very tiny... I am. Number? I'm talking about no more than 50 people and maybe even less than that. Okay. Because mm -hmm. um, there were some observant women, too, who lived in the girls' dorms but would come and eat meals with us. So this house that you were living in was, was male only? Only. In those days, there was no co-ed housing anywhere. Right. Um, and there was no supervision at all? There were no, quote, adults living No, in that's house? correct. That's mm -hmm. correct. If we had gotten into the habit of making wild parties, it would have come to somebody's attention. But that wasn't who we were. And, and no, there was no, no adult supervision at all. In theory, you know, the National Office of Young Israel ought to have been paying attention to us, but it paid none, because we weren't sending them any money. Um, and how is this house integrated, if at all, with the Hillel on campus? It wasn't institutionally integrated at all. It was a separate entity. But many of us who were active in either were also active in the other. So that we, you know, went back and forth, more or less comfortably. Um, what was the rabbi, the head of Hillel's attitude towards this young Israel house? <sighs> Favorable. I mean, he understood that we were providing a valuable service. He thought every now and then the orthodoxy of it was a little immature, which I'm sure was correct. Um, and he didn't like the National Young Israel Office at all. He thought that they were really just not carrying out what ought to have been their responsibilities to us. But we all got along with him just fine. What do you mean when you say he might have thought that the orthodoxy was a little immature? Sometimes, you know, some of us, not me, because I, I never claimed to be orthodox. You know, started insisting that a certain thing be done a certain way, which there was really no strictly need for it to be done that way. Can you think of an example? Um, the question of a mechitza at the Saturday morning service was probably the most persistent problem along these lines. Finally, one of the boys who lived with us in the young Israel house... What, wait, what was the issue? They wanted a mechitza, and, and, and there wasn't going to be one as long as he was the rabbi. And there was separate seating, mind you. It was the conservative style of the 1950s and 60s. Um, finally, one of us, only one, stopped attending the minion on this issue, but because he had also been the president of Hillel and was a regular Torah reader, he undertook every four or five weeks to read the whole Parsha, and that week he would come of course, he didn't want to daven there, but he also didn't want to leave the rest of us in the lurch. So that was an admirable, I think, a solution to his problem. But otherwise, you know, they wanted certain things that they weren't going to get, but there was no persistent tension over that. It was just one of the, after we graduated and were gone. What did you study? What were I was a philosophy major, which was much more academic and much more analytic than I realized it would be. Being a philosophy major turned out to be of no use at all in trying to understand the big questions of life, which is why I became a philosophy major. Uh, in later years, right down to the present, I realized how unsophisticated my reading of philosophical texts was. And part of what I said before about the education that I got, somehow, None of my professors helped me become more sophisticated in, in the way I read those texts. I, you know, I, I took courses, I did pretty well, but that was all. I just floated in and out of them. But I was a philosophy major. So you graduated in 63? Three, and I went directly to JTS. To the rabbinical school? To the rabbinical school, yes. At what point had you started thinking about the rabbinate? Before I was a freshman in college. So you went to college thinking that. Expecting that I would become a rabbi. Now, why I expected to become a rabbi is interesting, because I had no desire to be the rabbi of a congregation at all. 
Um, because rabbis of a congregation have to answer questions that I don't know how to, didn't know how to answer. Such as what? Like the meaning of life. Rabbi, why did this happen to me? Um, but I became, I went to the rabbinical school for the simple reason that I had never met a Jewishly informed person who was not a rabbi, which is a sign of something about the way I grew up. And I wanted to be a Jewishly informed person, so I figured I'd better go to rabbinical school and become a Jewishly informed person, and then I'll figure out what to do. While I was at the seminary, I realized I was destined for an academic career, so I went directly from there to graduate school. But, what was your experience like at the seminary? Oh, and so, and what years are we talking about? 63 now? to 68. I learned a lot. I learned an awful lot, and I can't... I don't want to betray my gratitude for that. I learned an awful lot. It was religiously a not very satisfying place because there was no real intellectual exploration of the kind of questions that I had hoped to satisfy as a philosophy major and still wanted to satisfy. These were, as you were saying, the quote, big questions. Uh, existential questions, right. Mm -hmm. the seminary just assumed that everybody will be observant, which was not the case, but it assumed that. And it taught a lot of texts. Everybody would be observant, meaning people out there, Jews? No, 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 no. Among and, the rabbinical uh, students. Uh, yes, the when you applied the to the rabbinical school, you signed a pledge to be observant. And what was meant by that at that point? Uh, Shabbat and Kashrut and Tfilah, I would guess. All of those were things that I was doing in those days anyway, so I didn't think about it much. Of course, I signed. But I was told that in the dormitory, maybe half the men did daven every morning, when I had assumed in my naive it was 100%, that kind of thing. Um, there, were, there were no courses about religion at JTS. Religion was not a concept that, that, that informed the way they did things. There were courses about Jewish thought, which were mostly, again, just reading texts. There were courses about history and a lot of Talmud and Bible courses. And I was in a special pre-academic program, so I didn't take all the rabbinic training courses. Because you had decided at that point... Because I just knew that I wasn't interested. Track. In fact, I was warned before I even applied, don't tell them that you don't think you want to be a pulpit rabbi because that might damage your chances of getting in. Um, that, I think, has changed over the years. And I have no idea whether this was just an urban legend or, or had some truth to it, but I wasn't going to find out the hard way, so I didn't tell them. And over the course of the... Once I was in, <clears throat> the increasingly clear reality that I was going to go to graduate school after that, um, didn't seem to bother anybody. But I had been told, the seminary in those days was in the business of training pulpit rabbis and everything else was incidental. What did they do to train pulpit rabbis? There were courses that I didn't take, courses in you know, the kinds of things you ought to know before you meet a young couple, before you do a funeral, before you, before you, before you. You know, Pastoral kinds past, of That's the word, they, yeah, pastoral training, right. Had I taken those courses, maybe I would have discovered how to answer people's questions, but I wasn't interested. And you weren't required to take them, it sounds like. Correct. I was in a special program that carried exemption from them, otherwise I would have been. So are you saying that the existence of this special program actually acknowledged at some level that yeah, there well, were people there who were not intending to be. Maybe yes, maybe rabbis. no. It just acknowledged that there were some people there whose proficiency in Talmud was such that they should be allowed to develop that proficiency and not worry about these other courses. Of people who went through that program, some, no, actually almost none became pulpit rabbis. But whether that was understood or is just, as it were, a coincidental reality, it's hard for me to know. Mm -hmm. Were there teachers there who were particularly influential for you? Well, certainly influential in my ability to learn 
to read rabbinic texts, which became the heart of my professional life. Uh, no, there were not teachers there who had a personal influence on me. I mean, Heschel was there, who had a great personal influence on certain people, but those were essentially his chosen acolytes. And otherwise, that was a closed group, unless one became an acolyte, which I was not interested in doing. Um, Mordechai Kaplan had already been eased out of the place, or I might have had a different relationship with him. No, no, there was no one there who became a personal mentor to me. So how did you feel going through the JTS program? Uh, I learned to be grateful for what it was giving me and to be disappointed in what I couldn't get there. Did it tell you, inform the way you thought about the American Jewish community or the conservative American Jewish community? Uh, the American Jewish community, not at all. It had some effect on the way I thought about conservative Judaism. Part of what I noticed, for example, and this changed in later years, most of the really powerful faculty members were European. The Talmud department governed the place, essentially. Were European. Almost none of them had been what we would now call pulpit rabbis in Europe. They were all scholars, very distinguished scholars. Yeah. But they conveyed a certain disdain for their own students because their students were not ever going to be as learned as they were. Yeah weren't even, it wasn't so clear, interested in becoming learned as they were. And we're going to go into a line of professional work that they didn't have much respect for. Um, and I began to suspect that many of these rabbis then went out into the field and had the same kind of sustain for their congregants, who were not nearly as committed to Jewish life as these rabbis wanted them to be and couldn't get them to be. Um, so that was a pathology, and I don't know how persistent it's been because the faculty, of course, now have a different makeup and a different attitude toward the students, so maybe the pathology has not continued. But it's a t Because when you got a bunch of rabbis sitting and talking to each other, the things they said about their own landing were not very pretty. The kinds of critiques that people involved in the early Chavarot were leveling at the American Jewish community, and that was more broadly felt as well, no. had to do with many of these kinds of issues. Correct. Its sterility. Correct. The performative Correct. aspect Correct. of it. The Correct. Big, all, of, all of the above. Big box all of, Judaism. Right, right. All of the above. That's correct. Right. Um, and, and these, it was very hard to tell whether these rabbis were presiding over this stuff because they felt that there was nothing they could do about it. They just didn't have the kind of following that they would need for this to be different, or whether they thought it was fine. That was very hard for me to know, mm -hmm. because I was having nothing to do with it all. Mm -hmm. So you were ordained in 68, is that right. correct? What path did your career take following your ordination? A standard academic path. I went to graduate school, I finished a doctorate, Wait, where did you do this? Uh, at Brown University with Jacob Nisner. Okay, so what, was, what were you studying at that point with Nisner? Uh, I was studying some courses in particular about the early rabbis, which was what he was doing, the Jews in the late ancient world. And under his guidance, I was taking a few other courses simply to broaden my background in, in related areas. I took a course on the history of Christian theology. I took a course on the New Testament, things like that. You'd known for a while at this point that you, were, you wanted to go on to do an academic degree. Well, not quite. One of, one of the features of my early adulthood was that I never really saw much beyond the next stage. So I couldn't think what I wanted to do after I left the seminary other than go to graduate school. My parents were both teachers, don't forget. Um, so probably had I thought about it, I would have realized that, but I didn't have a very clear idea. 
of what it meant to have an academic career. I just knew that I wanted to go to graduate school and continue learning stuff. Was Brown the self-evident place to be with Newsner, or were you considering uh, other places as well? I was. I, got, I was accepted in other programs. Again, to be perfectly honest, Brown offered me more money than the others. So I went there because I didn't see why that wasn't a reasonable basis for choosing. And I wasn't sorry that I went there. Um, and then, you know, once I had a doctorate, there was nothing much else to do than apply for academic positions. That too has changed, partly because the growth of the academic sector has slowed down. So now the Association for Jewish Studies, for example, at its annual meeting, actually has sessions on non-academic careers open to people with doctorates in Jewish studies. All that is much past my time. But yeah, then I just started what amounted to an academic career, what was an academic career. So where did you go first? I went to Sir George Williams University in Montreal, which is now called Concordia. And then I came to NYU for two years. The going to NYU in a sense was a mistake because again, I was naive. I didn't read the signals. I didn't see that the religion department at NYU was going to be demolished. And then it was, it was just shut down. So I needed to find another job. I had figured I would stay at NYU. I wanted to be in New York. Um, I went to Wichita State University in Kansas for three years. You were married at this point, right? I was married. At, uh, yes, I was married at this point. When had you gotten married, you uh, and, and Judith? I was married in 1969, one year after, after one year of graduate school. And yeah, we, we traveled together to all these places. Before we move on, I wanted to ask you about these, this period of your rabbinical school and, and the beginnings of graduate school, uh, because it coincided with a period of tremendous social ferment in right. American right. society, right. and particularly among youth, right. uh, with the <clears throat> development of the counterculture, right. the right. anti-Vietnam right. movement, right. civil right. rights, right. etc. And, and also the early, very early beginnings of second wave feminism. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, if at all, were you personally involved in any Almost of Almost not at all, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I had a very, you know, I had worked very hard to make myself at home in the tradition, in which I had not been raised after all. And so challenges to tradition, even challenges to another tradition altogether, uh, raised anxiety in me and weren't necessarily appealing. And when you say that, you mean the American tradition? I do. I do. Uh, right. Um, I mean the American cultural tradition. I also mean, you know, the, the tradition of protest didn't much speak to me. My tastes in music were then and are now very, very conservative. I don't listen to rock. I listen to Mozart. Did you listen to folk at all? Not very, much, not very much, not very much. I was exposed to it, so I was aware of it and not completely unfamiliar with it. But it wasn't what interested me. It wasn't what spoke to me in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, and as for the Vietnam War, it took me a long time to, to sign on with the op opposition to it. Were you aware of sort of dissent while you were at JTS? Oh, there was, there was great dissent among the rabbinical students, in, in, in particular about the war. And also there was dissent among the rabbinical students as to the unsatisfying nature of being a student there, which some people wanted to push back against more strongly than others. Um, yeah, there was all that going on, and I was aware of it. and. I, I, I sort of kept apart from it, mostly. Were you aware of faculty feelings? Almost not at all. They didn't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Heschel, of course, famously did. Yes. Otherwise, not at all. Mm -hmm. And it was known that Saul Lieberman, who was the academic star of the place, hated the communists because he was a refugee from the Soviet Union. Um, what was the feeling at the seminary? And among the people you knew about Heschel's involvement in the civil rights movement, his uh, involvement in the march was... It, it was fine, uh, except among his acolytes. Heschel was not 
always as revered as the memory of Heschel now has become. Mm -hmm. Because in certain respects, he cultivated, uh, you know, a, a, he was like a Rebbe. He cultivated followers. His attitude toward the student body as a whole was not always respectful. He couldn't, what do you mean about that? Uh, uh, he would speak to, I remember at least one occasion when he spoke to us as though we were little children, the whole assembled student body. I remember one occasion when he came to Cornell, while I was still a student there, to give a talk, and the talk consisted of reading a few pages from his book, which happened to be pages that I had just read. So I, I later came to see that a lot of academics do that. They go and give readings from their books and everybody is supposed to be grateful and pay the monoraria for that. Um, but at the time, I just thought it was shocking. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of what the response was uh, to Heschel's participation in the march, the Civil Rights uh, March? Uh, no, I actually do not. So it wasn't uh, something that everybody... He knew. wasn't a luminary in the building at the time. Except among those people whom I keep calling his acolytes. I know it's not an altogether respectful term, but. The 60s also saw the beginnings of the Jewish counterculture. Correct. Um, which grew out of the experiences of many young Jews right. in the larger right. social movement of right. the left, right. Right. Um, as well as issues within the Jewish community right. itself. Right. And at the same time, Israel was undergoing profound changes right. during this period. The right. Eichmann trial That's right. happened That's right. earlier that, in the 60s, and then the Six-Day War in right. 67 right. catapulted Israel to the center. That's right. Um, That's right. How would you describe your relationship and feelings about okay. Israel uh, during this period? I was, I mean, I, I wished Israel well, for sure. I had no animus toward Israel at all. At that point, I don't think I ascribed much religious importance to Israel. I just thought it was a good thing that the Jews had a state. And the state in those hands, as you will recall, was in the hands of socialists. The state as a state didn't have much of a religious aura. Um, I visited in 1966 while I was a student there. I had relatives there. I was in touch with them by correspondence. But none of your studies took place in Israel. That's right? correct. In fact, because I was in this advanced Talmud program, I was not allowed to spend my junior year in Israel, which is what most of my class did. It was as though the seminary didn't think that a person could properly study Talmud in Israel, which is, it leaves one speechless. Um, so, no, I, I went to Israel only for, you know, a, a brief visit before school started though, in the summer of 1966. I remember it was before the war because Jerusalem was still divided and, and all that kind of thing. This was your first visit? My first visit. Do you remember what your impressions were? I had a good time. I loved it. I loved it. I mean, it was, I practiced, you know, my Hebrew was pretty good, so I could function in the country very well. I traveled a little. Mostly I stayed in Jerusalem. But I traveled a little. I had relatives in a, a kibbutz up north. I had one friend from Camp Ramah who was living in Haifa. So I went and visited all these people. And I functioned entirely in Hebrew, so it was a good experience. But then as things turned out, I didn't go back for another 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, what about the Six Day War? How did that It frightened me very much. Why? Uh, because I knew that if anything went wrong, it would be a disaster for the Jewish people. So it frightened you as it was starting? Oh yes. No, it frightened me even before it was starting. Very quickly after it started, one knew that there was nothing more to be frightened about. Um, while the war was on, and again, I noticed this in myself and I couldn't explain it, I stopped davening and I just had the radio on constantly. And then once the war was over, not even when the war was decided, but when it was over, I went back to being who I was, who I had been. Um, I thought that was very peculiar even as I was doing it, but I, that's what I did. What do you think of it now when you look at it? Uh, I think it was very peculiar. Do you have any sense of what was going on uh, for you? I, I think I was protecting myself 
from the danger that the whole Jewish enterprise was about to fall apart. And then when it didn't, I just resumed what had been my role in the Jewish enterprise. As for the counterculture, I had no exposure to it during most of those early years. I'm a little bit of an, uh, of an interloper in this whole oral history project because it had nothing to do with the Chavarah movement until 1974. I was living in places where there was no sign of it, in Providence, in New Haven, in Montreal. And then when I moved to New York for those two years at NYU, we lived on the Upper West Side. What period was that? 1974 to 1976. And I had good friends in the Chavarah one of whom went back to that high school group, in fact. And so I started coming to the Chavara, and I very quickly saw, this is for me, this is good. And so I got very involved in the Chavara, but only starting in 1974. So earlier, had you been aware? Uh, hardly, of hardly. Response Magazine? No, I discovered that during those years in New York. Mm -hmm. I had no idea of any of this. Not the world that you were living in. Oh, wait, no, that can't be right. Response Magazine started before I left the seminary. Right. No, I was aware Just of before. Just before, just before. Because actually, I wrote a letter to the editor in which I engaged in a kind of pseudonymous uh, argument with Arthur Green. What was the argument about? Uh, about the kind of mystical... Um, Judaism that was coming to characterize the conservative movement, the Chavra movement, um, which I didn't, which wasn't, which didn't make sense to me. I, I thought, I had certain critiques of the Chavra movement even as I became very active in it. Are you talking about while you were still in rabbinical school you had this? Yes, I think so. Yes, because he and I just opened its doors in September of '68. Yeah, but Arthur Green was already Arthur Green before then. Yes, it he was, was the proto Chavara movement. You're quite right. The pre, just uh, pre. Uh, response, the plague, response period. magazine predates the the Violet. what became the Chavarot. Exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. um, and you know Arthur and I talked all the time. Mm -hmm. How did you know him? From the seminary, we were students together. Mm -hmm. Um. And then over the many, many, many years, we drifted apart, we got back together. You know, I saw him just last December for a very long talk. And then I wrote to him when Kathy passed away. And She's just just very recently, that. right, right. Um, he, re he represented a different way to th of thinking about Judaism than I did. And I tried a little bit to engage in dialogue with him. I don't recall much about that at all, frankly. Mm -hmm. How do you see the differences now of, in your approaches to Judaism well, then? What do you mean by now? Say that again, please. When you look from, from now, when you look back at that period, what do you see as you just said that you oh, oh, approaches oh. to Judaism? Oh, oh. Well, his, his basic understanding of Judaism arose out of Kabbalah and in particular out of Hasidut. And mine arose out of the classical rabbinic texts, which are a very different take on things. So what's the import of that, those differences? Uh, a much, I had, I was struggling with a much more sober understanding of God some of the flamboyant creativeness of the Kabbalah just struck me as being out to lunch. Um, and I was working much harder at maintaining a steady pattern of observance than that other part of the Jewish world seemed to find necessary. I guess that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it was why, also, do you, why do you think it was so much more work to maintain a steady pattern of observance coming from oh, the perspectives that you were Because having? I hadn't grown up that way. 
the world as a whole was not supportive of it. Even the world of conservative Judaism, once one got out of the bubble of the seminary, was not altogether behind it. And I was never, I was never unaware of the temptations of the outside world. Right? I had been eating yummy non-kosher food before I started eating kosher food. I had been going to concerts on Saturday afternoon before I stopped going to concerts on Saturday. So I had to keep telling myself, no, it's good not to have given all that up. Um, and it took a little work. It still takes a little work after all. I mean, here in Princeton, there are many deeply committed people to Jewish life, but not many observant people. So we are constantly, Nina and I, my wife and I, trying constantly, you know, very, you know, they're all respectful, respectful of us, but almost nobody hesitates to drive on Shabbat. Almost nobody hesitates. If it happens that one week someone's minion isn't meeting, it's entirely possible that they'll go car shopping. Uh, and we're, you know, we are dealing with that with people who whom we respect deeply and who are our dear friends. It sounded to me that you were saying, however, that Art Green and people who came from a, this more Hasidic yeah. sort of stream had less of a struggle around... I can't speak to that. I doubt very much that someone like Art Green has lived his life without a struggle. Mm -hmm. I know him too well for that. It's not, it's not really for me to say, but that's my strong impression. Um, yeah, I don't mean to denigrate other people's struggles, it's just that I was engaged in mine. In your own, right, exactly. Okay, so uh, one, one last question before we move on to your experiences in the Chavara in particular, and that is the, the issue of the draft, which right. was a major... <clears throat> oh, a terrible, terrible thing issue for right. young men of your generation. Right, right. I, of course, as long as I was a seminary student, had a divinity exemption. So, so this was through 68. This was through 68. When I graduated from the seminary and lost that, I was not yet 26 years old. So I was, in fact, available to the draft. What was the significance of 26? That was the age at which young men who had not yet been drafted moved into a kind of secondary category. They were looking for people younger than 20. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the, but you were still subject to the draft till you were 35. Um, Jack Neusner got me appointed as assistant Hillel rabbi at Brown. It was a paper appointment. My only obligation was to conduct Friday night services so that the Hillel rabbi himself didn't have to. But it preserved my, my exemption. Um, so the whole issue of the draft, in certain ways, uh, bounced off me and didn't really affect me. On the other hand, it was expected of seminary graduates that they volunteer for the chaplaincy. And I and a very small number of other people simply refused to do that. Um, I was going to go to graduate school and take my chances, and I wasn't going to volunteer, of course. Partly for the same reason. I didn't want to have to be a chaplain and answer questions that I couldn't answer. I just had no sense that I was suited for that role. When you say chaplaincy, do you mean in the military? I, I mean military, the military, military chaplaincy. chaplaincy. Yes, yes, I do mean that. Um, and as a result of that, I was barred from the rabbinical assembly for a number of years. It all had to be allowed to pass and quiet down and become a bygone before I wound up being a member in good standing of the RA. Um, but that was all a kind of draft, but not the government draft. That was the RA forcing people to volunteer for something that most of us did not want to do, but a few of us refused. Um, those of us who, if I'm trying to remember, were all going into academic work so that the placement services of the RA didn't matter to us. You know, 
I have to admit that was probably a consideration. Right. Right. One friend of mine volunteered, went to the physical, failed the physical, and looked so happy on being told that if that the medic who had examined him said, didn't you volunteer for this? Why are you looking so happy? <laughs> so my friend just left the room. He didn't want to start explaining all that to him. Um, but it, it was very stressful, you know, and led to a lot of ill will and bad stuff. Yeah. So you were exempt during the period you were at Brown? Yes. And you graduated from Brown in? 74. 74. So during that whole period? I don't know. I, I, By the time 74 you know, yeah, happened... I turned 26 in the course of my first year in graduate school. So you were basically so after, okay? I, I was basically okay. And I had a reasonably good, I don't remember exactly what it was, lottery number when they did the lottery. So I really went through those years unhappy that friends of mine were going through this stuff, but not feeling especially, except for the volunteering for the chaplaincy bit. I felt that all of that was not necessarily going to be a threat to me. So let's go to the, your experience okay. in the New York Kabbalah right. now. So the Havara was founded in the fall of 69. Uh, I'll take your word for that. And you first became involved some years later in 74. Right. You, said you were right. out of New York City during that period. Right, um, right. My first visit to the Havara was in the spring of 74 when I was down from Montreal in preparation for the move. And then I, I became very active almost at once when we moved down in the fall. Right. Um, and you became involved through a, f a friend, essentially. Essentially, right, some, right, some right. And immediately felt right, that's right. That's right. Identi identification that's right. comradery right. with this group. Right, and the friend knew that I would, which is why the friend had been so urgent that I should try it out. Mm -hmm. Describe what it was about the Havara early on that okay. you found so appealing. And then, just to give you a little roadmap, I want to then go and discuss uh, some, some of the specific sort of pillars of the Havara, the sense of community, okay. all right. Tila, well, et cetera. All right, so those... just as a quick overview okay. all right. um, of its general appeal to you. What appealed to me, first of all, that the people in it were very interesting, and a lot of them were rather like me. In what sense? They were academics. They were, you know, they, they were the combination that I represented of being pretty well-informed Jews without necessarily being traditional believers, which I was never able to become, although we haven't talked about that. Um, Say a few words about that right now. This is, here we are, you know, right. you're a rabbi. Right, well, that's another reason I didn't want to be the kind of rabbi who had to answer other people's questions. Uh, when I was a freshman in college, I had a friend, and we were walking, and I was explaining to him why I thought a Jew should be observant. And I gave an argument in terms of Jewish history and Jewish community and all kinds of stuff. And then he said, you haven't said a word about God. And I realized that I had not, because that's not how I thought about these things. And over the years, my, my piety, if I can call it that, has waxed and waned. But I could never just settle into traditional belief. Still not. And there were not of other people at... When you do too much academic study of Judaism, you develop a kind of layer of not cynicism, that's not fair, skepticism. It, it, it's hard, it, it, once you learn about the documentary hypothesis, you can't think about the Torah the same way. Would you say it gives you a level of detachment? Uh, yes. Or, no, I would put it differently. Your attachment becomes more intellectual than emotional. The emotional attachment is to the group, is to the people, which in the case of the Chavra was very powerful. So that was part of it. I just felt that these are people that I know how to talk to uh, and who are living lives not very different than mine. 
um, so we could share each other's lives very comfortably. I also liked the kinds of things that Havra was doing. Again, not so much the social protest thing, which was already beginning to fade by the mid-70s. But, you know, the, 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 month, the weekly meetings when somebody gave an interesting talk about something and, and the retreats when we would just go and hang out somewhere. I liked all that. That was all very good. And the, we, it, unlike, say, for bringing or it, it wasn't a davening chavura particularly. You know, on, you know, when we went on a Shabbat retreat, we had tefillah, but, um, and I liked it well enough. So it was more the community. More. The, um, so let's, let's talk about community, per se, because community was absolutely central. Correct, to correct. the Chavura. That's correct, correct. Vision for correct. itself and its ideal. That group of people is still as closely bonded to one another as any group of people that I know. And this is when the Chavura as such has basically ceased to exist for decades. How would you explain or describe the vision, the vision, the image, the ideal of community that the Chavura was seeking to embody at the point, at this point? Uh, the by the years? time I came in, it was already a little less ideological and a little less uh, articulate about these things. The community that had been created well, I was going to say it was just taken for granted, but I don't mean that in a skeptical sense. I just mean that it, it was part of, we, we breathed it. It was the air that we breathed. So the community was designed, A, to create experiences that we could share with one another. It was designed to create a framework in which we looked out for one another, which we still do. Most of the people who've come schlepping out to Princeton to visit me in my illness were members of the New York Havra in the 1970s. So that, that's, it tells you something. that's a mind-blowing fact. Um, I get a little teary when I think about that. So the community, the, the overt content of what we were doing, with, but you want to talk about community, I'm sorry. So yeah, well, we'll get to the bond, Bonding, a sense of being responsible to and for one another. There was a sense early on that we were the model of what the new Jewish communities would look like, but I think at a certain point we knew we should be glad for what we had and not be so ambitious about the outside world. You came into the Chavara at the beginning of its fifth year. It had been founded in 69. Right, right. Um, so it was you and, and, and Judith at the time, correct? Right, and maybe some other people were just joining when I did. I mm -hmm. didn't have a sense of that. What was the process at that point of becoming a member? There was no process. We, became, we joined. There had been a very elaborate process. Um, what with, do you know about that early process? Only that in later years it looked a bit ridiculous and pretentious. How so? Uh, interviewing people, asking them you know, to present uh, character references. There was one case with uh, names that I will not speak even after I was a member of somebody being blackballed because one current member said, I don't want them in my hover. That was all someone needed to say and that was the end of the discussion. But we just came in because as it happened, that same person just told the world that we were going to be members of the hover and there we were. So I, there was no process? There was no process. In our case, none whatever whether there had been discussion of us in our absence before we joined is more than I can say. If there was such discussion, it was not seemed proper to tell us about it. Once you were a member, were you aware of discussions of other people? Only this one incident about somebody who had made it clear that they wanted to join and the group decided that they should not. Based on this one well, strong dissent. I don't know whether other people were in sympathy with that dissent. That strong dissent was enough, mm -hmm. but maybe there would have been more had it become necessary. I can't speak to that. I did not know the people about whom this discussion was going on, so I had nothing to say about it. One critique, as you just alluded to, that had been leveled at the Chavura in its very early years was that it was elitist. Yes. Well... Well, yes, an elite needs to be elitist. It's, it saw itself as 
a vanguard as, as yeah. It was, you know, elitism is a funny kind of thing. It's only objectionable if it's not deserved. By the time you got involved, would you say that people, the people who wanted to become members, who were self-selecting, so to speak, were, did fit in easily? That they, some they were self-selecting in, in, the, in a reasonable way? Some, some more than others. The cover had a reputation which attracted certain people who, in fact, were not a good fit for it. Some of those people drifted away. What would make someone not a good fit? Uh, social awkwardness, um, inability or unwillingness to adapt to the level of observance that the Chavara did expect at its organized events. Um, people who just participated in group discussions in an unproductive way and taxed other people's patience, stuff like that. Was there a process by which people were ever removed or asked no, to leave? Or no, were they literally no. They just they don't, they, and some they people read just, the, They read the tea leaves. And some people didn't read the tea leaves. They remained members and other people talked about them. Uh, no, there was no process for that kind of thing at all. One of the things that happened over the years is that the Chavura began to develop what you can call, it's a slightly oversimplified term, a two-tiered structure, which in later years, thanks to Mitt Romney, I thought a little bit about makers and takers. Right? On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Chavura held public services and the inner Chavara more or less conducted them, but dozens and dozens of people came who were essentially consumers in the, cons in the synagogue model. Um, and that changed the exper our experience of what it was like to have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services. Why did the Chavara decide to have such open services? I don't know. That happened during the years that I was living in Kansas. And when I came back, it was already just the way that things were now being done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, how would you describe the people who were involved, and how many members were there at the time uh, that you and Judith got involved? Maybe two dozen. It's how I can't describe them generically. They were, you know, very distinct individuals. Um, there were professionals, and there were um, academics. There were a few people who were just, you know, people who joined, became active or not so active. There wasn't a type, there wasn't a profile. I really, it was part of what made it interesting. Right. Would you say there was a certain level of observance that people shared? Uh, yes, although it was also partly that they shared that when they were with one another. There was no question that people were more or less observant in their private lives. There were still are members of the sort. It's like a neutron star, you know, what was left when the thing exploded. Not all of us keep a kosher at home. Most of us over the years became less observant. <laughs> so that very few of the original members of the Kavura, who are still part of this group, are Shomer Shabbat anymore. Very few of them eat kosher out, although a lot of them still have kosher residences. So that kind of thing attenuated. Many of the very early uh, members in the very first years were seminary students. Correct. Either, mainly from JTS, a few from HUC. Correct. Did Correct. that continue to be the case, or did that change by the early mid-70s when you first got involved? A lot of my good friends were seminary students. I don't know what the proportion had been earlier. I really can't answer that. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of seminary people there still when I was there, though not everybody. And not, um, mm -hmm. that was not always an indicator of the level of people's involvement either. Would you say that <clears throat> members of the Chavara shared, in general, a political orientation? 
Well, there's certainly a left orientation. Uh, they were more and less radical among us. Um, yeah, that, I mean, more than that, you know, people were interested in different issues. Some people were interested in domestic social justice issues. Some people were interested in peace issues. Um, these people didn't argue with one another about you're getting interested in the wrong issue. But they didn't all do the same things by way of acting out this more broadly shared commitment um, that would now be called progressive. When it was first founded, the New York Havara, like Havara Shalom in Boston, which had been founded a year <coughs> earlier, was mainly a male community. Uh, by the time, by the time no, that was no longer the case. No longer the case. Not in any noticeable way. Mm -hmm. The friend who recruited me was female. So there were many women. Oh yeah. At that oh point. yeah. Mm -hmm. Including very centrally placed women. What do you mean by centrally placed? People very active. You know, people who helped to set the tone. People who do a lot of the work. That's what I mean. Yes. People whose voices were heard. How would you characterize overall the status of women at, during this period within the Chabara? Uh I would say, not a, the women might not agree, completely non-problematic. That, that, that was done. That was You're on done. the other side of that. That's right. Um, when the New York Chabara began, they rented an apartment. Um, yes, on 102nd Street. 102nd Street? I think so. Uh, which served as the central meeting place. Yeah, Jerry Serrato lived in it, and we used it as our meeting place. Right. Was that, so that place was still there? Yes. At the point that you were involved. Right. How important would you say the apartment was? As uh, Well, we needed a meeting place, and we were really too big. The apartment had been chosen in part because mm -hmm. it had an enormous living room. That's also where we had our high holiday services before this opening out that I mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> without the apartment, there would have been another level of organizational task. You know, where are we going to meet next month kind of thing. We didn't have any, and the apartment had a kitchen. So it was very helpful in preparing Shabbat meals. Shabbat and, meals. Well, we had a show, once a month we had a Friday night dinner in the apartment. Okay. So, so I wanted to ask you next, what were the regular occasions on which, okay. and the rhythm? Yes, good question. Good question. I can tell you that because it was very firmly fixed at the beginning, and though over the years it eroded. We met every Thursday night, and partly to do whatever business needed to be done, and partly because there was a program. And there was a member, there may have been a, more than one at a time, whose job it was to make sure that there were going to be programs every week. Mm -hmm. So that was the most regular thing we did. What kinds of programs were there? Uh, usually one of us making a presentation about something, either from our own work, academic or not academic, or something going on in the outside world that one of us wanted to talk about. Every now and then it must be, though I don't remember very clearly, that it was agreed to bring in somebody who would speak. And the idea always, of course, was that the presentation should open up into discussion. So that was every Thursday. Was there a meal as part of that? No, there was nauseous. Nauseous, okay. And there was stuff to drink. Wine and even some booze. Mm -hmm. um, on once a month, we had Friday night dinner. I was just mentioning that. And everybody would bring something and you, could, you really couldn't cook it there because we couldn't, you couldn't cook for 25 people in this one little kitchen. So people would bring stuff, but the kitchen was available to heat things up and stuff like that. Um, and all that had to be kosher, and all of that needed to have a veggie option already. Um, was meat served at these places? Oh yes, meat was served. Most of us in those days were committed carnivores. Um, and then afterwards there would be this complicated procedure by which people who had spent more would get a, a re, you know, get, recover their expenses and people who had spent less would pay into a pool from which the other people could be, all that kind of thing. And you know, that got very complicated and annoying. But it worked, it all worked. 
Once a month we had, oh, on those Friday night dinners, we also had a tefillah. We began with Kabbalah Shabbat, and then we had dinner. Um, once a month, on a different weekend, we had a Shabbat retreat. Yes. Where we all went away, all being whoever went. And again, we brought all the food with us and all that. Um, and after the retreat, again, we, we evened up the expenses. And again, we had Kabbalah Shabbat and dinner. And then in the morning, we had a tefillah, which over the years became harder and harder to do because more and more people were just not getting up for it. And we needed to have a minyan, wanted to have a minyan, and then we had lunch. Then the afternoon rolled along. After Shabbat, we did something of a kind that was good for after Shabbat, and then on Sunday we went home. So those were really very nice, a lot of fun, and that's how we really got to know each other. We also had a two-day retreat on the beginning of Sukkot and Shavuot. When again we went away, often to the same places. Where where were these retreats take place? Um, in in the winter we went to Shelter Island, which is off Long Island and was manageable in the winter. When the weather was a little more mild, we went into the Catskills, and in each case there was a place that we always went to. We had a working arrangement with that place. Uh, and we went there. Over the years, these retreats became more and more sporadic. And now, it's been a while since any of them has happened. Over what years are you talking about when you say they became more sporadic? For instance, during the 70s, were they still going full swing? After 70, into the early 80s, the holiday ones, gosh, into the early 80s, the Shavuot one was still going on. When I moved back to New York to teach at Stony Brook, I no longer lived in Manhattan. What year was that? That was 1979. I was away from New York for three years. Uh, and a lot of that was now going on. We also had a child. A lot of that was going on already without us. Part of what we learned in terms of our original image of community is that people's lives we're going to make that much harder to sustain as people got older, as people moved away because of their careers, as people had children who were more and more demanding of their time and energy, all that. Uh, to some degree, we hadn't really thought about it. Um, there was some talk of buying what would amount to a retirement home for those of us who are no longer following careers, who are no longer raising children, but none of, nothing ever came of that talk. Um, so by the time you came back and were in Stony Brook... Well, I was living in Queens uh -huh. for the first while. And then, anyway, you know, we went in regularly, but not dependably, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So for the high holidays, we certainly went in. And I don't remember more about that. I don't remember whether the meetings were still going on every Thursday, but I just wasn't going to go in every Thursday. Um, right. What about the retreats at Weiss's Farm? Were you part of that? Never. I've never been to Weiss's Farm. I was completely absent from all of these developments until 1974. You don't believe me when I say that. I do believe, but, but it's true. was Weiss's Farm retreats not happening in 1974? Oh, they had stopped, I think, as soon as the Havara Institute began. I may be wrong about that, but I think the Havara Institute, who what were called the Havara Conferences, which was also... Late 70s. Yeah, no, yes, late 70s, right, the first institute was 80. Mm -hmm. um, right, so uh, we went to a lot of institutes, and we went to the high holiday services. And You're talking about later, in the 70s and so 80s. After we moved back, 70s. right, and no longer lived in Manhattan. The other thing that I should mention is that already during the two years that I lived in New York, the Chavara spawned a men's group. And the men's group lasted longer. I was going into the men's group meetings until well into the 80s. No, what I was going to say, which is why I wasn't sure it was worth taking the time, is that I don't remember. Suddenly the idea was afloat. Let's have a men's group. We made a little game of it. Don't tell our wives. Let's make believe we don't know what they're talking about. So it was like a secret, non-existent men's group that everybody knew about. Um, and most of the same crowd of characters, men, joined it. 
it wasn't ever quite as exploratory or consciousness raising as men's groups was supposed to be. But it was just another way to get to know each other. And I, I valued it. it. Again, it was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Over the years, there have been occasional efforts to reconstitute the men's group. But it's just too hard. Too many people are too busy. And, and too spread out. And too spread out. At this point. Although the great majority of us still live, of the people that I'm talking about, I probably live as far from New York as any of us. There's here in a, Princeton. Here in Princeton. There's a, Bill Aaron is in California. Okay, but um, that's far. Yes. How large was the men's group? May uh, 10, 12, something like that. Mm -hmm. We met in the same apartment, which was funny because how could you keep a secret there? But no one else was there. And anyway, so really good talk, but it was... Do you think it was influenced by consciousness raising groups? Oh, it had to be. That of your course, wives, many of them had No, been it had to be. It had to be. Uh, and among us, there were those... Again, as with so much of what I've talked about today, I was less reflective than a lot of those people. There were those who consciously and earnestly hoped that this would become such a group, but it just didn't. Hmm. So let's turn to another sort of pillar of Havara life, which is tefillah, prayer. Right. Can you describe your own experience of prayer? and how that comported with the attitude towards tefillah within the Chavura, your earlier experience. My own, it's being personal, not... Personal, it. yeah. Uh, well, as, as I have said, um, all of my Jewish experience somehow was lacking a strong sense of, of the theological. Yes. So, you know, uh, there have been times in my life when I was very committed to regular Trila. And some of those times, I had a sense that I was actually addressing whatever. Uh, although, probably it was always in a little bit of a, of a projection, that is to say. I was addressing whatever was my way of saying that I was saying something that was very important for me to say. Yes. Um, my concept of tefillah, the kind of tefillah in many of the groups that I described much earlier today that shaped me, tefillah tended to be very traditional. I mean, especially in this living unit at Cornell, which was officially Orthodox, and the davening at JTS, which is essentially Orthodox with, without a mechitza. Um, and then, as I may not have mentioned, I belonged, when I lived on Long Island, to an Orthodox synagogue for 22 years. Because it was, it was more like a Chavura than the giant other synagogues in the area. People really cared about each other. Everybody was there for Jewishly serious purposes. And we liked it there. But the davening there also was very traditional. And that shaped my taste in tefillah. Um, in the Chavura, it was really like that earlier on, partly because we had more people who were familiar with the traditional tefillah and could carry it. Later on, as more and more people joined who were not familiar with it, it had to be loosened up a little bit, which is fine. I'm not passing judgment. I'm just describing. Um, so I could fit into that tefillah very easily. I almost never led tefillah, but that was more of a reflection of what I think my voice sounds like than any more religiously weighty no. reason. How important was tefillah in the, in the, in the context of the New York cover up? Right. Um, what, what do you think tefillah was trying to achieve? Nobody talked about that. Tefillah was just built into the Shabbat programs. Let me interrupt for one sec to ask. In 74, by the, when you joined, were there regular Shabbat tefillot every week? Or, no, no, or no, still no, no. just this once a month? Just, well, twice a month. There was a Friday night dinner. Friday night and month. then the retreat. That's all. That's all. Were most people, would you say, going to tefillot elsewhere on the other two weeks? I can't or answer that. I was not. You were not? I was not. 
it was always my firm practice for years and years and years and years to read the Parsha every week with some attention. But it wasn't my firm practice to go to shul. Mm -hmm. That changed in this Orthodox shul on Long Island because, again, I just got pulled in and became an important part of the community there. And But, of course, once you join a community, you start doing things the way the community does them. So how would you experience, how would you describe the experience of tefillah? In the Chavura. Yeah. Um, very pleasant. Very... It was part of why we were together. But we actually did remarkably little talk about what, you know, we didn't share what it meant to us. We didn't say whether we wished it were different in any way or whether we liked it just the way it was. Um, it was a little bit just part of the, 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 the woodwork. It was just the way. When we were together for Shabbat, part of what we did was have tefillah. There were people on Friday night who managed to come when tefillah was over because they wanted to join for the dinner. That kind of thing. It's just, and not everybody came to tefillah and it wasn't. As long as we had a secure minyan, nobody really paid attention to who wasn't showing up. But then when we began to not have a secure minyan, and yet people weren't willing to get up early just that, that caused some resentment. At Chavarat Shalom, there was much attention paid to the tension between tradition and right. innovation within the service. How right. would you characterize the service? Much more traditional. Much less reflective. Much less conscious in that way. From bringing also in Washington paid much more attention to the tefillah than we did. We ultimately were a social and intellectual rather than a davening Chavura. At Chavura Shalom and at Fabrengen there was a lot of attention <coughs> to quote making the tefillah meaningful. Yes, we didn't I don't recall that we worried about that much. Mm -hmm. Were uh, Rev Zalman and Shlomo Karlbach significant factors? Not much. Shlomo Karlbach was the subject of a certain amount of derision because of his attitude toward women, for one thing, which had some notoriety attached to it. Um, and Rev Zalman, I think, was already a little too flaky for a lot of the people in the Chavara. Mm -hmm. um, yes. One of the members of the Chavra early on was Lynn Gottlieb, who went off to become a very non-standard rabbi in Arizona, but sort of dropped out of the Chavra scene. We lost track of her. Mm -hmm. But she was already who she was in the Chavra. Yeah. What about the role of uh, Torah reading at, at the Chavra? We, we shared it out. People who could did. Mm -hmm. You had a Torah scroll? We... The Chavara still owns a Torah scroll, mm -hmm. which I think is kept in the Heschel school, except when we need it. Um, how we got it, and from where we got it, I don't know. It also happened during my years of absence. Those, at one point, I offered to give lessons in how to do these things, and I had one or two people who attended semi-regularly. Mm -hmm. They were actually more interested in learning how to read the Haftarah than the Torah, because it takes less prep let's face it, and we only needed to do it once a month at the Shabbat retreats. So we would divide it up. No one person ever read the whole Parsha. You know, there were enough of us who could do one or maybe two aliyot that it wasn't burdensome. And we did it. And we also had Torah discussions at this occasion. Mm -hmm. I haven't mentioned that. Uh, which were also a very important part of the experience. How so? Because we, you know... And, and what, what did the for discussions consist of? Uh, somebody would raise a few questions. Someone who had prepared in advance? Or, yes, or one person would be designated to do this. Mm -hmm. And if nobody was, then we just waited to see whether anybody in the room had some thoughts to share. Um, and then we talked about these questions. We, we just shared our thoughts. We, there were a lot of people in the room who were good at that kind of thing. So the discussions were well worth it. My current minion, which meets at the university campus, is also like that. We have a, you know, a whole bunch of professors who are smart people, and so the conversation, I, that sounds elitist, but I mean, it only, it, it makes the discussion time well spent. 
how, how would you describe the approach people took to discussion and interpretation oh, of the weekly oh, parsha? Oh, good question. Um, mostly we shared you know, sort of the fruits of the academic and reconstructionist, like for the moment I'll combine them, reconfiguration of how to think about the Torah. Can you elaborate? Uh, nobody... It wasn't that often that someone said, what is God trying to tell us? What is the writer trying to tell us? What is, or at best, the Torah trying to tell us? The idea that the Torah came down in one chunk directly from heaven was just not even defended. Um, that all the rules in the Torah had to be obeyed was also not usually defended. Um, we were all leading the Jewish lives that we were, and it wasn't in most cases because it said so in this book. Hmm. But the book, you know, had a certain history. The book was the origin of everything and therefore was entitled to a certain respectful attention, which is what we gave it. Um, right, I remember once, I'm going to talk about myself now, the very first Torah discussion you ever participated in was about the command to exterminate Amalek. And everybody was looking for all these reasons why Amalek deserves this treatment. And I said, I, I was brand new there, Maybe they didn't. You know, who? How do we know that they deserve to be exterminated? We don't go around exterminating people now because they piss us off. Um, and I felt empowered to say that, although I didn't redirect the conversation. I said that, and then the conversation kept going. But I was very glad to see that I was in a place that I could say something like that. Was there a, a response to what you not said? Not much. Not much was getting late in the discussion. I suddenly had this idea. People really wanted to get on with Musaf already. Um, Musaf, by the way, at a certain point became optional. So who decided? The, the, the leader? Usually the leader. Usually the leader. That was true in a lot of these venues. That's true in Minyan Ma'at and Anche Chesed also. Um, the leader had a lot of autonomy. That was one of the ways in which we empowered people. If you're leading Shacharit, you'll do what you think is proper to do it by the leader of Shacharit. Yeah. Uh, so I found Tfilah comfortable, which I mean in a strong sense, not as a trivial word. Um, it was about the only davening that I did in those days. And it was good to do, and it was part of my experience of Shabbat in the Chavurah. Right. While we're talking about tefillah, I want to focus for a minute on the issue of gender and women's roles within the context of public worship at the Chavara. Now, Art Green had described the very beginning years of Chavara Shalom, so this is in the late 60s, 68, mm -hmm. 69, as sort of a pre-feminist moment. Right. And I think that's fair. As you are well aware, second wave feminism, as we were just discussing, was just starting to get underway. Yeah. Women's consciousness groups. Your wife at the time was very in, right. Was involved in these in the early beginnings of Jewish feminism. Right. 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 Can you talk a little bit about yes. that and your perspective yeah, I, on it? I have to begin with what may seem like a, an an over intellectual distinction, but I think it's important. I don't know about feminism, but I do know that the tefillah was fully egalitarianism but at the by the time I joined. And again, I can't speak about the first five years at all. Women led, women led the discussion, women read the Torah. The women were Talesim? Oh, gosh. Kipot? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I would guess that some did and some did not. Um, so the issue of women's participation was not an issue at all. What it meant that women were now participating, which already gets us a little more into a kind of thoughtful feminism, if I remember correctly, the men in the group were not yet much alerted to this question, but some of the women, again, my wife among them, had begun to see that this is a very important question. 
just as they had begun to see maintaining the tradition is already yielding to male authority because the tradition was shaped by men. So is there a feminist obligation to not maintain the tradition? Um, that kind of question was beginning to percolate. Um, but as I say, more than that, I think it was no, it was no longer, a, it was not yet a dominant theme in the ongoing um, life of the Chavura, because the egalitarian stuff was taken for granted, and the ideological stuff had not yet really found its place into the agenda. That's my recollection of those early years. Those early years. The early years of Jewish feminism, women often were concerned with having a, a role in public, right, this, right, this, right. An, egal, an equal role right, in right, public worship, right, right. but not necessarily in changing the that, liturgy and fundamental That became ways. a very important question. That's part of what I'm trying to say. Some women wanted to fight their way into a tradition that had been undeniably shaped by men. Other women said, it was shaped by men, we need something that was shaped by women. That was an issue that was beginning to emerge among the feminists, but I don't recall that it came into the mixed gender life of the Chavara very much, because I don't think the men had come to see what kind of a question that was. Do you recall, for instance, whether uh, in in the in the liturgy at at the Chavara, for instance, were the imahot being regularly no, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. not yet. I forget when that first came into the official liturgy of the conservative movement altogether. Not so long ago, maybe twenty years ago, but we're talking about something more like forty years ago. Yes. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a straight traditional liturgy, pretty much, but pretty, pretty much, much, but with women. That's right. Reading Torah, women well, with, leading that's right. that's services, right. which had also been what was going on at my teenage synagogue group, where again we just used the Silverman Sidur, but women played the same role as men. Um, yeah. Whenever there was a stronger Orthodox presence, as at the Hillel, then of course that couldn't be, and not at the seminary either, yet. Um, this was the time of the famous Ezrat Nashim visitation to the um, the, the, Feder the GA, the GI? G -A. G -A. Right. Um, that happened, I think, in 72, mm -hmm. so a little just before my time. So. The, the impact of that was being felt. And in fact, there had been, and uh, were, were, that what was happening then were a couple of national conferences that's right. that took place in New York. That's right, that's right, that's right. I, I went to one of those. The second one, men were invited. That's right, that's the one the I first, went to. The first one was women that's only. That's the one I went to, so that's right. You went, what was that like for uh, you as a man? I found, you know, I, I didn't feel that I was all being marginalized. I thought the fact that they wanted me there probably meant that they were glad I was there. Um, as opposed to something that has happened much more recently, that people from the previous dominant groups have been told, we don't want to hear you, we want you to sit quietly and listen. None of that was going on, at least not in the particular sessions that I attended. Mm -hmm. There may have been other sessions that where it did, I can't speak to that. Um, so that, yeah, that was all part of my learning about all this. And I knew that I was there to learn, that I was not yet ready to be a, a player in a lot of that stuff, except my marriage. Um, but that, that was part, I was, yeah. And... Um, so were you sort of uniquely position because of your relationship with Judith? I don't think uniquely. I don't think you as a man? No? No, 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 I don't think so. Um, it was, ta was it talked about within the, any of the, the meetings that took place at the Chavura, mm -hmm. the sort of the role of women? 
some, but it was mostly by way of egalitarianism rather than the more theological and ideological dimensions. Some of that was coming in. Judith would talk that way, but not everybody quite knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, goes back a little bit to what I was saying much earlier, that um, my sensibility in all these stuff was pretty traditional. If it wasn't going to be traditional, then I might not be interested in it. That's part of the problem with the conservative synagogue here, where the davening can't be traditional, because not enough people would know what was going on. So I don't find it very rewarding to go there, frankly. Uh, because to me, the traditional m mode is a way that I sort of keep myself in the mainstream of a very long history. And that's what brought me in in the first place. Um, yeah. But I, I also mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the GA thing. The, the activities of Ezrat Nashim were certainly being noticed in the Chavara. Certain members of the Chavara were also very active in Ezrat Nashim. So that was beginning to introduce these larger questions. And it may be that what really happened is that that's the point that I moved to Kansas. Right. Because right. um, I came back and it felt different already. There were big changes there were big taking changes. place. There were big and, changes. Uh, consciousness was being raised That's right. That's right. over this period of time. But overall, all Ezra Nashim really wanted initially was also just to get women into the rabbinical school of JTS, which is not a very revolutionary thing to want at all. <laughs> Although it turned out to be. That's as maybe. <laughs> yes. That's as maybe. Yes, that's indeed. the law of unintended consequences. Indeed. Some of them were intended, but that's another discussion, too. Yeah. So that was my experience of it, you know, that I, I saw that something was happening. It was coming very close to me personally. Um, but it was a little too early for it to be setting a larger agenda the way it did, say, by the mid-80s. Right. That was a whole different world. Yes. Well, you know, certain people in the group I'm talking about the, the current group, also have obsessions. The, your current group. The current group, right? So if somebody wants to talk every year about God, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. They can't let go of that. It's a really very interesting question. I don't make light of that. Um, so if they're going to lead a Torah discussion during those few weeks when that's the theme, right? you know where you're going. Right. Um, I get very interested in the sort of God's punitive side, which is sometimes really quite unpleasant. Talk about that. Um, I get interested in some of the stories in Genesis, just because those are really interesting characters. Were those uh, those different kinds of approaches manifest in the the these early cover wrote um, uh, discussions, as you recall? I don't recall, but I can't believe that they weren't. How could they not be? Because we were a quite varied group of people who took turns, not in, you know, in a systematic way, of opening up these discussions. And so they would lay out certain themes, which were the kind of things that they wanted to talk about. And the discussion either would, in fact, pursue those themes, or somebody would hijack it and talk about what they wanted to talk about. Right. Um, Personalities also. Per always no, out. no, no, no. We had a lot of strong personalities <coughs> in the group as well. Right. So let's focus for a minute on the issue of um, gender and mm -hmm. women's uh, status within the context of public worship. Right. You know, Art Green describing the period just before your involvement, uh, the very beginnings of the Havara movement, the first few years or so, um, described it as what he called a pre-feminist moment. Um, mm. But at the same time, second wave feminism was beginning to yeah, right, take right, root of right. women's consciousness right. was being raised, right, with right. men's consciousness right. to extend. Right. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, many of the founders of Jewish feminism were members. Well, coming out of this were environment. Were coming out of the New York Harbor Rab. First through a class that they brought together, right, and then and ultimately you find founding Esther and in seventy one, seventy two. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> By the time you got involved in seventy four, what what roles were women playing? Okay, 
Um, you have to remember that because of my earlier experiences in all these other environments that I described to you, women had always been equal, well, girls, had always been in, equal to boys. So this was in Ramah? This was at, at the East River Jewish Center. This was at Ramah. This was not so much in the public worship at Cornell Hillel. Um, Cornell Hillel, in that sense, sort of replicated right-wing conservative Judaism. There was separate seating, but no mechitza, and girls played no role in the public leader, leading of the service. Though in other respects, you know, female students, you know, could be the president of Hillel, you know, all these other things where that didn't apply. Um, at the Chavura, it was just taken for granted that Tfila would be completely egalitarian. But since, after all, I took that for granted too, I didn't think it was exciting or new. I just thought, yeah, this is another piece, another outpost of the world in which I have been shaping my own Jewish identity since I've been 15 years old. Yeah. Had it, had, if you look back on your own life, um, was the very idea of egalitarianism always resonant for you? I just took it for granted. You took it for granted. Do you, was there a time in which that term Egalitarianism oh. sort of became a yeah. term of... There must have uh, been such a time, but it's been for so long now that I just take that term for granted that I can't pinpoint it. Yeah. I'll tell you one story, back to my high school days. This teen group, once a year, led the late Friday night service in, in, the, main in, service. in the main service. In those days, you know, conservative synagogues had these 8.30 late Friday night services. And one of our female members led it. And the rabbi's only comment was, why did she have to wear a red dress? This is the late 50s you're talking about. Uh, right, mid, mid, to, mid to late 50s. Yeah. Huh. I mean, he had no objection to our doing it that way. He had no objection to her leading the grown-up service on this one occasion, which was, after all, special. But why couldn't she, you know, sort of not call attention to the fact that she was a goyle? Um, do you recall, in the mid-70s, women wearing either a tallit or... Not much. I began to notice that a little bit later. Okay. Judith made herself a tallit at a very early point. She probably wore it, but I, you know, again, it was she. She was one of the leaders of that world, and she did. Um, she didn't buy a storeboard one. She made one. Um, what about women um, having alias? No problem. No problem. No problem. All happening. Um, and um, counting in a minion. Well, we, you know, as I say, until it got to be a problem on Saturday mornings in the retreat, that was never a problem. We were a group of 30 to 40 people. Not everybody would come on time. A few people on a Friday night would make a point of coming when they figured the tefillah was safely over and they could come for dinner. But mostly that, you know, it, we weren't counting with any sense of, well, gosh, where's the next person going to come from? There are enough people. And plenty of people. Plenty of people. Um, do you recall any first times that women were doing something in the Chavara where it was... Oh, yeah, there were a few women who had grown up in more traditional environments who had their first aliyah in the New York Chavara. And that was very lovely. That was very lovely. Um, a few women who read the Torah for the first time in the New York Havara. What was that like for you as a man, sort of experiencing... Uh, I, I thought it was lovely. I mean, I like all kinds of people to learn how to read the Torah and read the Torah. Yeah. I mean, as, as I said, in, in the strict context of liturgy, other than my years at college, from which I always kept myself a little bit distanced, 
it never occurred to me that there should be this distinction between the genders. So when I saw that there was no distinction, I didn't say, oh, how exciting. I said, oh, there was a guy, an Israeli guy, who married this, music, this musicologist, um, who was in New York as the economic attaché to the Israeli consulate. So he would show up at Kav Ramani's in a three-piece suit, because he came directly from the office. And... So that made him feel a little uncomfortable. On Fridays, you're talking about Friday night? No, Thursday nights. Thursday nights, yeah. Um, but on Friday nights, he once said to me, getting used to the sound of a woman's voice leading tefillah took him a while, because he had grown up Orthodox. Um, but he got there. And he was choosing to... And he, to be, and, and he belonged up. And, right. and he married a woman who was not going to... Fool around with this stuff, right? Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, Judith Glasgow um, mentioned that uh, the Chavurot at some point became a, a breeding ground for a liturgical change. <coughs> Excuse me. Influenced by feminist thinking, Jewish feminist thinking. Yes. Um, <coughs> Probably a little later. A little later, and a little less in the New York Harvard Road than in the others, as I recall. But again, remember, after 1979, we were back in the New York area, but much less heavily involved in the Harvard We were living in Queens. We had a child. We were busy. And it was hard to get there. Hard to get there, and the worst of it was finding parking. Um, Yes, the, the Havara Institute was an important breeding ground of that particular thing in particular, yeah. which I guess we'll get to eventually as well. Yeah. Do you think that changing attitudes towards women, the ordination of uh, Sally Presan in 72, mm -hmm. or um, Sandy Eisenberg Sasso in 74, or the Reconstructionist movement, had any sort of impact on how things felt by the time you got into oh. and how practice was in the I experienced as Ratnashim, which I you know watched from up close but not in, um, as aiming at the conservative movement. So that the fact that these other movements were way ahead of the conservative movement, ah, yeah, didn't matter a whole lot. Um, and to some degree, of course, given that the conservative movement also has its own sort of elitist attitude toward less halachic movements that yeah. just was part of the problem. Yeah. But after Ezrat Nashim, well, actually, they made two famous demonstrations. One was the General Assembly, which was not the conservative movement. But the other was at the RA, which was. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, they, right. And... Then slowly, slowly, advocacy for ordaining women began to emerge within the conservative movement. Starting in the 70s, starting but into the 80s. That's right. That's right. Uh, and um, Ezra Nashim and its, if I can call it that, fellow travelers, were among the really important people pushing that. Um, you know, it's hard. How much were you personally influenced by uh, what you were hearing, discussions with Judith um, and, and others who were involved in Ezra and Hashim, as you said, you had a close-up, right, a really right, close-up right. view. In my private life, um, I was in the program from the beginning, so to speak. But it was also true, by definition, that I had never met a female rabbi. I had never met a female Cantor, that is a Jewish professional identities, took me a little longer to come around with. In what sense? Our, a female rabbi was just somehow unfamiliar. So the unfamiliar always takes a little longer. I got to the point where I couldn't see any reason why there shouldn't be female rabbis. When was that for you? Oh, gosh. When are we talking 70s, 80s? When are we talking? Uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. We have to throw in a little bit my years in Kansas, which we have not yet talked about. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Which was in the middle of, of this period that we're talking about. So I went 76 to... 76 to 79? Right, that's correct. So tell us why you went to Kansas. Because I lost my job. We lost our jobs in New York. You had been at NYU. NYU. Mm -hmm. And the whole religion department was abolished. It was an ugly political maneuver. And I had been much too naive when I took that job to wonder whether I had to worry about such things. So, of course, I did worry about them, and then I needed a job. Judith needed a job. We both got jobs at Wichita State University. So we moved to Wichita, Kansas, which is the flip side of, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. We were now in Kansas. <laughs> yes, um, very far from New York City. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, we met, you know, in the small and battled enclave of liberals, many of whom were at the university, we made really good friends, and life in certain respects was very convenient. It was small, you know, you could get places, I could walk to work, which I had never had a job like that before. Um, when it was 106 degrees, I didn't want to walk to work, but I could walk to work. Um, and that's where our son was born. The minute he was born, I said to Judith, we can't raise a child here. But we'd been living there already for a year and a half, and without a child, you know, it was a way to live. Why did you feel like you couldn't? You because there was, no, there was no Jewish substance anywhere. There was no place where he could learn from Jewish models to whom I wanted to expose him. So what was their Jewish life there? And what, there were two and what synagogues. There it? were two synagogues, a reform one and an orthodox one. The orthodox one was sort of orthodox. It had no mechitza. And allegedly he had a letter in its file from Rabbi Soloveitchik allowing it not to have a mechitza. I never saw the letter. Um, but you couldn't tell the members of these two synagogues apart from one another. It was all a matter of you know, family loyalty to one or the other. There was a small number of people who had kosher homes, a very small number of people who kept Shabbat. Neither rabbi had anything which I thought I could possibly learn from him. Um, so it was just very thin. Huh? What did you try to do? I tried to create a chavara on campus for Jewish students. But was Judith teaching there as well? She did. But there weren't any Jewish students, and the Chavara turned out to have a Hebrew Christian for a president and a non-Jew for a vice president. Sweet kids, but you know, they were... Uh, why, why were they there? It was a nice group of people. You know, I can't say that they were takers because they were, you know, the leaders of the organization, but there was no Jewish substance in it. I tried to get a few of the, how can I put this, smarter people whom we knew, to engage in periodic Jewish study, privately. And that worked a little bit better, but only a little bit better. So I refused, we refused to join the synagogue because we made a, a statement of we will not join a synagogue that is not egalitarian. Um, and we never did. On the other hand, nobody in the synagogue had the slightest idea what we were talking about. So, you know, it was it's sort of like a pat on the head. Oh, that's nice. Sounds kind of lonely, Jewishly. For you. It was terribly lonely. Yeah. You know, and by ourselves, we had our university friends, and we, you know, had, had each other. But there was no community. There was no Jewish community. Um, but I learned something about how most American Jews live, which was a lesson that I have never allowed myself to forget. Of course, it's not that different here in Princeton, which we don't have to talk about on this right, recording. But <clears throat> what is that lesson? The lesson is that the conveyance from one generation to the next of real Jewish content, so that the commitment becomes something more than sheer sentimental nostalgia, is very hard to do. It requires an enormous investment of commitment, time, and energy on the part of those people who can do it. I call it the Big Ten, which is an athletic league, but my Big Ten is time, energy, and neshama. 
somebody has to invent invest these things or the community will just empty out so i learned that in kansas i think we should stop here for <coughs> in addition to tefillah uh, dedication to Jewish learning was a priority. Right. In um, by the time you joined in the mid seventies, how how important were classes, actual classes? Oh, yeah. there were there weren't any by by class. If you mean a single session, in which somebody teaches an interesting text and gets discussion of it going, that's what these Thursdays were. And that's what would happen at the retreats. And, you know, enough of us had access to Xerox machines. So not a very long text, but you took a page and you made 30 copies and you put it. There was also, by the way, the first night of Shavuot, we stayed up all night. In so the, we had a tikkun. We, had a t we were young. We could do that. So again, you know, at various hours of the night, somebody would do this. Um, there were no classes in the sense of courses. Everything was... Basically one shot. If a person wanted to do something that needed two one shots, you, you just found you know two opportunities to do half of it each time. Um, no, we didn't have we didn't. Chavurat uh, Shalom had courses, as I recall. Yes. For bringing, I don't know. Uh, we didn't we didn't do that. For one thing, those of us who could have taught courses were doing that for a living, and it was enough. Right. Um, it's like why students don't come to our minion here. It's enough. Um, but we had a lot of active learning going on and a lot of... Um, in this way that you're describing. In this way they don't... Right. Somebody would bring a text, distribute copies, and tell us what he or she wanted to tell us about that text, and then we'd discuss it. One such text could be the program for a Thursday evening. Right. One such text could be one of the hour slots at the... Tikkun of Shavuot. Um, did uh, many members of the Chavura um, teach? Did, oh, did you? Yes, I did. Um, what did you teach about? Tell us some of the kinds of what what, you what I know is Talmudic texts. So I took an interesting text and presented it, explained why I thought it was interesting, and we talked about it. Um, I have no recollection of what, which those texts were. We were talking about a long time ago. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing I would do now. Um, so that, yeah, Bible scholars taught biblical texts, medievalists taught, you know, people who knew um, Hasidists taught Hasidic texts. You know, nobody, nobody was, this is going to sound much worse than I mean it to sound, Nobody was really stretching their boundaries. People were just sharing with other people that which they had to share. And since people had such different things to share, over the long haul, everybody learned a lot from the others who knew different stuff than what they knew. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And discussion was satisfying. It was a pretty good group of people to have discussions with. So you're describing... Um a situation where someone with some expertise, presumably, would teach. Yes. Um, to and it was the the, the students were members of the Havara. Right. Well, they you might bring your friend. In so other it's words, fine to bring a friend. Uh, most of the time, yes. If there was reason to think something more or less sensitive was going to go on, then maybe you thought twice about it. But no. in a class, though. Oh, no, no, not a, but on, on a Thursday evening, if in addition to the class. Ah, I see. Um, interesting, because, um, you know, the original vision for learning um, and teaching in the Chavara uh, envisioned a, a non-hierarchical yes. or ideal. Right, well, you know, I, I, I must say that as time went on, more and more people who originally would not have dared felt empowered to do this. So the non-hierarchical principle, in principle, held. The problem was, as I said, you know, I put it rather harshly before, once we started having makers and takers, there were people there who were very grateful for what other people had to offer, but just sensed that they had nothing that they could offer in exchange. And they may have been right in some cases. 
And also, as time went on, I told you about this one musicologist. There were also people, you know, who could talk about art. In other words, the, the, the list, there was no narrowly defined list of acceptable topics for these things. You know, those of us who were Jewish studies professionals did what we did. But other people were not Jewish studies professionals, but they felt that the group was willing to hear from them as well. Um, <coughs> so how would the, 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 the list of these classes be developed? Was it just a, you could sign up, or was there any discussion about what it was? That no, was no, no, no. I mean, as I recall, I think, oh boy, mm -hmm. I, I, I think somebody, somebody, maybe a small group, took responsibility for a certain period of time to make sure that there would be a program every Thursday night. So if you wanted to offer a program, you talked to them about it. See. And would they pretty much automatically accept a program like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the only question was, you know, variety and, and other scheduling needs. So an individual person might be told, I don't think this is the right time for that because we're having this and this and this just before it, or, or whatever. Were there topics that the Chavara as a whole, would you say, wanted to address? In, in oh. I think some of the earliest members wanted to keep the, le the level of social consciousness somewhat higher. Um, and again, it's very important, since we're talking about me, to remember that I was not a founder. Some of the... Uh, some of the edge of this had already begun to blunt by the time I got there. And I myself, you know, was neither temperamentally nor intellectually equipped to do that kind of thing. And I was tolerated so that, you know, when I taught, I didn't teach something like that. And I didn't know how. Um, so that it went on, but it began to fade. You know, the kind of, instead of learning a text, let's talk about what we think about, I don't know, the environment. In those days, we didn't talk about climate change. Let's talk about climate change. Um, or let's talk about welcoming ceremonies for baby girls. I don't recall that that very often became the official topic of a public gathering of the group. People talked about these things all the time. And as the years went by, many of our members had baby girls. Um, and we went to each other's simchas and, you know, and when somebody was in a really sort of catty mood, we would compare what we liked. To, oh, that was a nice ceremony, but... Um, so that, that was, you know, part of the price you paid for belonging to this group. People were never happy just to say Mazel Tov and to get on with it. Um, so that kind of thing went on, and it often did give rise to one level down conversation from the official conversations in the formal meetings of the group. Right. And of course, we saw each other all the time. If there was one Friday night dinner a month, on the other Friday night dinners, we were all at each other's homes. But those, you know, clearly smaller groups um, reflecting already some of the inner social networking of the larger group. And also presumably where people lived. How Correct. How accessible they were. Correct. In, gee, a bunch of us... I don't remember when it began to happen that a bunch of the members, the old-time members, moved to New Jersey, mostly Teaneck. So, but, you know, those people have to be willing to get into their car on a Friday night and come into the city. Um, most of those people, when I first got to know them, also lived on the Upper West Side. Um, but it had to do sometimes with children. It had to do with all kinds of things. So the group became a little more widespread. Um, and that affected... So that was one of the things that happened to the Thursday night meetings. If you know, if you worked until six o'clock on Thursday night, the idea of an eight o'clock meeting in Manhattan, if you lived in New Jersey, lost some of its appeal. Right. Right. 
did you, were these classes, so, um, let me back up and say it a different way. What was your experience teaching this kind of a class compared to teaching in other settings? particularly? I've almost settings? never had a university class with that many people who really knew the stuff. I almost never had a university class where the, I never taught graduates, rarely over all my career for various reasons that are not really to the point. Today, I was teaching undergraduates and although I had, I had a few, what can I call them, refugees from the yeshiva world, mostly it was set at an introductory level all the time. Um, and they learned, and some of the bright ones learned enough that by the end of my getting to know them, they could come into my office, we could have really good conversations. But the level of the class was, was rarely as satisfying as what the Chavara could do when it was really grooving on a topic. So would you say that in alignment with the Chavara ideal that teachers were learners and learners were teachers and that that actually did, that oh, yes. was your experience? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, sure. You would find that you would actually learn things? In I was learning classes? a lot. I mean, you know, um, probably, you know, I knew as much about Talmudic text as anybody in the group. I knew nothing about Hasidus. I knew almost nothing about medieval Kabbalah. And so I would sit and learn from people who knew as much about that stuff as I knew about anything. And it was great. Would you ever learn things in your own classes that you were teaching? Also, yes. I would certainly learn things that people saw in these texts that I had never noticed. Some of them were non-specialists, but very good readers of, of text. So, yeah, I often came away thinking, oh, that's interesting, yeah, right. They brought different perspectives. Different perspectives, and just sometimes a flash insight that they had into, in, into a particular text that I had just never encountered before. What would happen at the, the retreats, the monthly retreats? Was there intensive study and text study or other kinds of study going it was, on? It, it, it was, to some degree, just an extended version of the same thing. I can walk through one of these retreats. So we got there on Friday afternoon. One of the interesting changes that took place is that the idea that you should get there before Shabbat began to erode. Right? And, and since I was trying very hard to be Shomer Shabbat, I noticed these things. A lot of the other people was okay with that. It was okay with me too. Ultimately, I wasn't going to pass judgment on these people, but I felt that it made a difference in the and why the group thought was there. Um, so we began, we began with a certain amount of just logistical stuff. Food had to be put into the oven, um, hot water had to be prepared, stuff like that. Everybody had to go and make their bed. But then the program would begin, unless a few people informally wanted to do something first, with Trila and dinner, after which there would be a session, not very different necessarily from the sessions we've been talking about. And then, and this is an important difference, it's not like people went home. So people just sat around talking, um, oh, till all kinds of hours. That also in the long run had an effect on when the minion could meet in the morning, but yeah, everything touches on everything else. Um, and then in the morning we got together, we had those breakfast and then tefillah and then Torah discussion, and then ultimately lunch. There may have been time before that. If the weather was good, people also bought the, some outdoor time. So the truth was we couldn't program the retreat too tightly. Um, and then after lunch, there would be more of the same, but there would also be nap time built in. Um, and then at night, on Saturday night, there was often something much more... Um, Fun. Like? Like, you know, a whole bunch of us played chess till all hours of the night, or, you know, uh, word games, you know, whatever people wanted to do. This was not going to be a, an activity for the whole group. But after a while, people got to know each other and people knew who are the other people who would like to do on Saturday night what I would like to do on Saturday night. So that just all worked out. Sunday morning, I think there was no formal program. There was breakfast, and if people, if enough people wanted to make a minion, they could. But it was not expected 
that part of the obligation of the members was to help make a minyan on Sunday morning. And then we cleaned up and went home. Enough of us had cars that everybody could get there. Singing. You asked about singing. I um, I am not a singer. I love listening to music, but I'm the kind of singer who doesn't contribute to the... I sing between the notes, as somebody once said. So there were probably groups, you know, subgroups, who broke apart, especially on Friday night, and sang. But I usually found somebody to schmooze with instead. Um, were there things like campfires where people would sing? Oh, not outdoors. It wasn't that kind of a place. Some of the places had fireplaces. And then they would make a fire. Um, would there be a fire going during Shabbat or not? Or well, again, over, you know, it turned out that there would be. Eventually. Eventually. Mm -hmm. Maybe even from the beginning, I don't remember that. Right. My very first retreat was a Sukkot retreat, which was not Shabbat. And it was nice, and people kept feeding the fire, and it was great. And then the next retreat was a Shabbat retreat, and I noticed they were still feeding the fire. It was, yeah. So not everybody did. But again, nobody wanted to make a scene over it, so that it just happened that way. Were there other aspects of Jewish culture that were... Yeah, that were... I mean, some people read Jewish literature and made their presentations about that. Sometimes we read a little Kafka. Sometimes we read a, a little I.B. Singer. It all depended on who was there that felt that they had something to you know, present. And that, like I said before, there was a widespread feeling that really no topic is off limits. And people, on the other hand, didn't push that too hard so that um, a topic that might have been off limits just was kept off limits. Um, was there anything about the way teaching and learning happened and teaching for you happened in this context? that had any, had any impact or influence on how you taught uh, in your university classes? That's an interesting question. The kind of teaching that I found when I, still, when I was new was very like the kind of teaching that I did, so that in a sense I just fit into what I sensed as the existing way that things were done. And that's the way I taught my university classes too, that is to say, I walked in with enough stuff to say that if nobody else said anything, it would be fine. On the other hand, I almost never told students, you can't ask questions that you need to cover some ground. So that if anything, one of my teaching weaknesses was that I let students derail me a little more than was really good time management. But especially if students were asking good questions, I couldn't say, why don't we talk about that instead of what I want to talk about? It's a perfectly good question. Um, and likewise here. Here, of course, there, were no, um, there was no curriculum. There was no syllabus. I didn't have to worry about time. So I just let the conversation go where it did. If in the course of it, I suddenly realized, oh, but there was this other, one other thing that I really wanted to make sure I said. So I just stopped everything and I said it. And then we went. For, then we moved on. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, just while we're thinking about retreats for a minute, is um, the presence of children. Uh, when I first joined, if I remember correctly, the only children were Sharon Sperling and Ruthie Ellenson, and they just became part of the scene. And then you know, Judith and I moved to Kansas, and we came back, and there was Alex and a few other kids of his cohort. Uh, Adina Rosenbaum was a little older than him. Eitan Davidson was a little in between those two. Judith Rosenbaum was a little older. Um, and some of those kids are still very good friends today. And yes, at the retreats, in the course of time, when there were enough of them, one of the things that always happened was that the kids made a play. And we all sat there, and of course we told them how wonderful it was. What kinds of things would they make plays about? Oh, gosh. Was it Jewish themes or, or anything? Maybe. Maybe. Um, 
One year, a couple of the boys and their fathers played a father-son baseball game. It ended very badly because the fathers won and the boys lost it. So we didn't try that ever again. The boys were pretty young at the time, like seven, so it, um, no one thought of mixed teams? <laughs> no one thought of mixed teams. Well, they came, the kids came up with this idea. Hey, we'll play the dads. And so, you know, I didn't realize quite how badly it was going to end. Clearly none of us did. So I said, oh, okay. And then it ended very badly. Meaning they were upset. They were very upset. They were very upset. Um, which was no surprise. It's just that we hadn't really thought about it. It all happened very quickly. So we went out to the baseball field. And we played this game. And there it was. Uh, but the kids made a play. Uh, the, as they got older, the older kids would join in the discussions. A lot of them were going to day schools so that, you know, they had some at least textual knowledge to bring into the thing. And if they went to one of the better day schools, they were used to the format of people sitting around and talking about a text, not just absorbing knowledge, but engaging it. So that was very nice. Very nice. Um, yeah. Um, so let's turn our attention, at least briefly, uh, to the question of political activism and, and social justice okay. issues. Um, because as we've mentioned already, the New York Havara was founded and in many ways grounded, at least in the original vision of it, as sort of the nexus of political Correct. and Correct. And religious values. Right. Re re religious values engaging in the world. Exactly. Um, by the time you became involved, what was the role of political activism in the in the in the Havara? Right. I, I would I would say those individuals to whom this was very important, and I don't mean this in any kind of patronizing way. Um, were still members, and to them it was still very important. Um, and they engaged it, and they tried to get the rest of us engaged it, in it, with more or less success. Um, but the public agenda of the group as a whole um, displayed that less and less. Or at least that's my memory of it. Um. What's your sense of why that dissolution? Oh, I, ca I can throw out a whole bunch of possible relevant things. Age. People got older, they didn't have energy for it, they didn't have quite the same kind of idealism. Uh, professional obligations, which just took a lot of time and energy. Family. It's one thing to go to Washington for a rally if it's just you. But if that means you're leaving a spouse and three toddlers behind or whatever, you know, it's different. And to organize the whole family to go, that was a project. Um, In terms of uh, Vietnam... Yes. There, you know, there were... There were members who... Uh, do you know the name Burton Weiss? Yes. Yeah, so... So there were people in the group who tried to get the group as a whole to engage in semi-mass activity in support of Burton Weiss. Can you explain what that is about? Uh, well, he was doing a sit-in in the seminary. I forget the time. And for all... A sit-in for what? I think it was anti-Vietnam. Some of this happened while we, I was living in the Midwest. So I heard stories but didn't experience things. You know, and we were going to pick it in front of the building. We we're going to bring him out under protection so that he could address the group. And then we're going to bring him back in under protection so that nobody tried to seize him. Um, he, and he was in the seminary. I believe that he was a rabbinical student at the time. Mm -hmm. And the sin was taking place in the seminary chapel. Um, But that's all that I remember. There was also Watergate, after all. Um, these things became things that we talked about when we got together. But, you know, it's like, so we, don't, we all want to change the world. I don't think anybody was trying to change the world in quite 
the original way anymore. To the great regret of a few members of the group who didn't want to see the group evolving away from this commitment. But my sense of it, as I remember it, is that that's what was happening. Uh, the Jewish counterculture was also mm -hmm. um, in swing big, big. at that point, um, and and uh, members of the Chavura were often very self-reflective about yes. what was going on. They were writing, there were books, yes, there were articles, yes. All that, newspapers, right, right, right. etc. Were you personally involved in contributing to... I didn't do much of that. As I've said earlier in this conversation, I was not very reflective about these things. I, 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 my temperament was just much more private. When I was invited to write something, I often did, but I would never on my own have started generating materials for circulation. Did you read uh, magazines like uh, Response? Oh yes, I had, a sub I had the whole run of Response until I retired. I left it in my office. Um, yes, I read Response. I read a Moment when it was new. Um, did you read? Did you start reading Lilith at all? It, well, it came into the house, so I looked at it. Of course, it still comes into this house, and I still look at it. Um, yeah, I, I read Lilith. I read. I was also reading, you know, some general issue political things. I read the New York Review of Books. I read. Um, Gosh, it's been a long time. I, I, I read, I read stuff. Yeah. Um, um, in regard to and, and excuse me, and every now and then, I did feel a pang of guilt that I was not letting it affect me more deeply than it was. Um, that should be added to the story, because I knew that I was watching all this kind of from the outside. But but I let that be the case, frankly. I just did. In what sense were you letting it be the case as opposed to... I, I could have reoriented my priorities. I could have made myself do stuff. I could have made myself to go to more rallies. I could have changed the kinds of stuff that I was teaching. Um, and I didn't very much. I just did what I liked doing and continued doing it. Um, this is a period in terms of Israel where it's after the Six Day War, it's after the Yom Kippur War, it just happened the year before you right. joined. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe your relationship with Israel at this point, your relationship? My, um, or yours, yours and Judith's? I wished it well, I sort of followed events. What I remember very distinctly about the Six Day War is that during the duration of that war, I became like obsessed with it and did nothing else. And during the Yom Kippur War also, basically I just let it crowd out of my life a great many other things. But as soon as, that's the, that's the mail. As soon as each of those wars was over, I just sort of closed the file on it and went back to being who I was. Um, this was also the period 73, when um, some members of the New York Hamara were uh, deeply engaged in trying to get Breira. Yes, I, I belonged to Breira. Off the ground. You belonged to Breira. I belonged to Breira. Uh, I was not a very active member because, as I said, I didn't do that kind of thing. But Breira looked to me like the kind of organization that I ought to be supporting. What appealed to you about it? I agreed with its politics. As I began to think about those things, um, I was already, I was already disillusioned enough with where Israel seemed to be heading, that it felt to me like somebody who would get it, who could get Israel in its collective vagueness, to reorient its priorities, would be doing a good thing. Yeah. But Reva made the mistake of positioning itself a little too far to the left and ultimately it became unsustainable. I remember one Salute to Israel parade in New York City, in New York City you know, the big parade, 
for, for Israeli Independence Day? Well, it, it takes place in the spring sometime. It's supposed to be, but because so many from people take part, and it can't be before Lagva Omer, and you know, Yom HaOsmolt is before Lagva Omer. There was always a little bit of shakiness in the scheduling of it. Um, Breira did not participate in the parade. Instead, they stood at the margins of the parade, handing out leaflets, expressing all their misgivings about Israel, which I thought was a sign that Breira didn't quite understand how to be politically effective in the Jewish community. And it, it, it dwindled. Um, what, in general, was there an overall response to Bray Ross? Which, after all, was right there. They were actually early on renting yes, yes, uh, yes. space within the Chavara itself. Yes, we, no, we knew those people. But, but was, the, was the political orientation no. within the Chavara? No, Bray Ra as a topic, again, uh, allowing for the possibility of forgetting things, uh, was not really on the agenda. So it wouldn't come up for instance, as a topic for conversation. No, Breira wasn't invited to make a presentation on some Thursday night. Deliberately, you said? N no, because that's not what the Chavra discussions on Thursday night were already all about. Now, those of us who had good friends who were really active in Breira would talk about it with them all the time. But, um, yeah. Okay. Um... So let's move to some reflections on what impact the Chavara had on you. Okay. Um, and, and your involvement as time went on, which was considerable. Right, at right. At the national right, level. Right. So we've been discussing mainly this period 74 to 76, and then once you returned to New York. Um, so just to recap here, what, what would you say were the most significant ways that the New York Chavara had changed or evolved over the course of the 70s. And okay, yeah, the into the 80s. 80s. Um, in my life, you mean, not... Right. The New York Chavara became the matrix of one of my, many of my most important friendships. I just uh, compared it before to the Cheshire Cat. You know, there was no there there, but it was very important. Um, and I treasured that, and I worked on that, and especially after it was my turn to have a quite spectacular divorce, and those friendships were very important to me. Um, but the New York Havara was so in alignment with my own conception of what a nice Jewish community would be like, that it didn't need to change that conception very much. I just sort of... Uh, it met my needs so nicely that I just let it meet those needs. And then as the Chavara began to change so that it met those needs a little less well, there was nothing I could do about that. So, you know, my, my deep appreciation for it became a little tinged with regret and nostalgia. This is into the, you're in the 80s? In the 80s and even into the 90s, right. What do you think, how would you just, just, just to give us sort of in one place an overview, yeah. what were those changes that had happened over the course of the 70s and into right. the 80s? The program became much thinner. I don't mean that each individual program was less good. I mean, there were fewer programs. The Thursday night meetings stopped happening. The monthly retreats stopped happening. Um, um, Right. Those two things, which were very important to my experience of the Chavara, were just not part of the experience anymore. Um, meanwhile, I was living away from New York anyway. I went to Queens, but that's like away from New York. Um, oh, in many ways. We won't go there now. Um, so that whatever was going on in the Chavara was a little bit less available to me. There was also the Chavara men's group, which I have been forgetting to talk about, which okay. was, you know, a, a bunch of guys who met... At what point is this? Oh, God. Oh, 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 my. I think while I was living on the Upper West Side still. 
because our earliest meetings were in the apartment. And it was kind of silly because we officially didn't exist as a group. We didn't talk about it with our wives, except, of course, we did because every now and then we all disappeared. Um, you mean you didn't talk about it with your wife to the extent that they didn't know it existed? Technically. Of course they knew it existed. Um, and you're talking about the 70s still? I'm talking about it began probably in the, toward the, sometime during the second half of my two years on the Upper West Side. Which is when? Uh, 75 to 76. Okay. Then I moved away, and when we moved back to Queens, I did drive in once. It met more frequently at this point than the official Chavara met, and I generally went in. But the truth is, every now and then I got preempted by something else, or Alex was sick and I had to stay home with him. Um, what can you tell us, 50 years later or so, <laughs> about... What went on at these meetings? What was the agenda? There were sh mostly schmoozerai. Every now and then we shared some stories about our younger days, some of which were slightly spicy and many of which were not. We didn't very much, and this was to the disappointment of some members of the group, we didn't very much get into our own feelings about stuff. It wasn't a very... It wasn't the kind of men's group that the 60s and the 70s was generating. It was much more just a bunch of guys hanging out. It wasn't a men's consciousness no. raising group no. in the sense no. that women's consciousness right. I think it, I think it might have been, as I no, not I think. <clears throat> I know that there are people among the original members who hoped it would become that, but it didn't take long until we saw that it wasn't going to because not enough members of this group wanted it to. How many people were involved? Eight-ish. I could probably name them all, but that's not the point. I mean, most of them were members of the Chavara. One or two of them joined the men's group, although they were not members of the Chavara. Um, and we met regularly. It was an important thing for us to be meeting regularly, but it was much less deep than what a men's consciousness raising group would have been. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Were you glad for that? Were I you... personally? Yeah. I didn't mind. I would have had to work hard at keeping up with the conversation if it moved into a deeper level. Though I kind of knew that would be good for me. Yeah. But I wasn't the one who was going to push hard for that to happen. Right. Um, And then, like everything else, it just began to meet a little less frequently. And I moved eventually from Queens out to Long Island, which made it, like, impossible. And then, as far as I know, no such thing exists anymore. Every now and then, a bunch of the old-timers say, let's revive the men's group. And everybody says, yeah. And then nothing comes of it. I learned are, this are, wonderful... Are one-off reunions in the meantime, or not? Uh, well, we all see each other all the time. That's different than coming together... As a group. As a group, no. and just the men. No, they were not really. No, they were not really. Uh, the closest thing I came to that, and again, it would have been on my kind of superficial level, I learned this wonderful acronym, Romeo's, Retired Old Men Eating Out. Yes. So I tried to get a bunch of us to become... Uh, we would meet once a month, and eat somewhere. As a Romeo group. As a Romeo group. But then, you know, it never happened because it turned out that I meant lunch and some of them meant dinner and we just never got it off the ground. Yeah. Just, what do you think that speaks to? It's interesting. You had all come from an intensive community. Right. Essentially. You knew how to do this. Right. Um... It came in part from the fact that people's, their Big Ten, as I called it before, was just attenuated. Remind us what the Big Ten were? Time, energy, and the Shema. Um, it came from the fact that the capital that we were living off was so rich and so abundant, it was just there. And, 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 you know, we all knew it was there. And we could, like, 
They say about people who haven't seen each other for 20 years, but they remembered how to resume the conversation. We're like that. We're like that at this point. Uh, uh, we all get together at the home of one of us most July 4th weekend. July 4th, that's just the thing we do. Um, and otherwise, we're just constantly just meeting each other in, in subgroups and various permutations. You're friends. We're friends. We're very important good friends. Yeah. And... That, those friendships are not gendered. Or at least for me, a lot of those really, really important friendships are with women. Have there been other contexts in your life in which you've made such good friends with the numbers of women that you did through the cover-up? Uh, here in Princeton, in these last few years. Um, well, not largely, that's a little strong. Significantly among people whom we first got to know at the Summer Institute. It's a Havara grounded networking. So let's, let's talk about that. All right. um, how did you get involved in Havara activities at the national level? Okay. Um, when the first Havara Institute, there had been these conferences, which like many institutes, which I also never went to, partly because... So you didn't go to the Rutgers conference in 79? Is that what you're saying? No, no. You, did, you didn't? I did not. In the summer of 79, we were moving back from Kansas. Right. So I was distracted. But by 80, I was invited to be one of the teachers at the first institute. So that was the first summer institute? Yes. The one, it was at the University of Hartford. Correct. In July of 1980. Wow, you know stuff. That's right. Okay. Hartford, I remember. The date, I would not have remembered. I mean, the, the month. Um, and I became a regular at these institutes. I must have attended, I'm making up these numbers, 15 out of the first 20. And it became a very important part of my year. And again, a whole network of friendships began to emerge out of that. I'll, I'll get in a few minutes to why I stopped going, which is just one of the accidents of life. Meanwhile, I was also invited to be a member of the founding board of what was then the National Chavara Coordinating Committee. So I got involved in, in the governance of this whole thing a little bit. Although, partly because I already did not live on the Upper West Side, you know, I, I couldn't be a regular in the office. It had an office in those days. I was a little bit marginal to some of that. What was the, the, um, the sort of province of the National Chavara Coordinating? Never clear. Never clear. Um, it wanted to be what the name said. It wanted to be the home office of the Havara movement in the United, or in North America, really. And it never quite pulled that off. And already, you're saying in 1980, did did the the Havara, um, the National Havara Committee, conceive itself as um, either? being the coordinating body for a movement, for a movement, or was that aspirational at that point? A little of each. A little, a little, in other words, it worked hard at maintaining that consciousness of itself, but it, it, on the ground it wasn't getting anywhere, and I think it just, it was too hard to sustain as a purely aspirational theoretical thing. Uh, but the National Chavara Committee became the sponsoring organization of the Summer Institute, which to this day is one of the most successful programs of its kind that I have ever seen. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, it lasts a week. I don't have to tell you facts about it. I mean, it just generates deep contact among people. Please do. For, first, describe, I mean, give uh, us some facts about All right. So... It runs from a Monday to a Sunday, so that it culminates on Shabbat. During the week, there are two classes a day, really formal classes that meet four times. Um, nobody can teach in both slots, so that all teachers are also learners. Um, there is a smaller group who runs it, who supplies the energy, and one of the really nice things which you don't see among all the great organizations of the 60s, is that the younger generation has taken it over. 
So you know that, that was a little weird because I was like this old guy watching from the from the bleachers. But it, it, it worked. It worked. These are young, some of whom are the children of my generation, and some of whom are just young people who found the institute and loved it and joined it and became more and more involved. But all right, so there are these two classes. In the morning, there is tefillah, lots of different varieties. The only rule is that none of them could be non egalitarian. So, what kinds of varieties would there be? There would be a, what they call traditional egalitarian, which is basically davening. There was a so-called Havara style davening, a lot more singing, a lot less adherence to working their way through the Sidur. There could be a Four Worlds minion, which was much more um, internalized experience. There could be a feminist minion, there could be... Um, what would be a feminist minion? Women were doing it their way, bringing in a lot of other stuff. Um, on Shabbat, there could have been as many eight, as eight such minyanim. During the week, there were probably more, more like four. And there were meals, of course. Everybody ate in these cavernous college dining rooms. But there was a lot of conversation that just went on. On and on and on and on and on and on. There were also workshops, so-called, where which were like one-shot things, some of which really like mini classes, other were skills teaching, some of which were just novelty sessions about some weird thing that somebody wanted to explain to whoever cared to come in and listen to about it. Um, and then there was an evening program, which was much more relaxing. Um, including an auction where a bunch of money would get raised every year. Over the years, they developed, thanks to certain very generous donations, programs for bringing in subsidized 20-somethings to create a new generation. And some of those people then became the leaders of the organization. Others, you know, drifted away. That's all standard. Um, but, and then came Shabbat, which is like the emotional high point of the whole thing. Um, yeah. And then Saturday night would be a big party and, you know, and all the rest of it. And all these friendships were just being cultivated and preserved and, and maintained. As I said, many of our dearest friends here in Princeton are people whom we saw once a summer at these things and now we see them all the time. Yeah. How um, many people would come to the... Um, when you look back... Um, at that first one in 1980 and then the early years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some of them pushed 400. For a while there were two or three a year. Two or three? Institutes a year. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the one in the Northeast, one in the California, and sometimes the third one in the Midwest. And that turned out to be as so often happens, the Havara committee was overextending itself and had a pullback from that. So now, at least since the 90s, there's been only one. I think 85 may have been the last year of plural institutes or thereabouts. Um, we also had a magazine, a wonderful magazine called New Traditions that published only three numbers, also back in the 80s. Uh, the Havara, the NHC, came very close to bankruptcy in the 1985 area when I, for my sins, was the national chair and had to sort of get us through that. Um, it was partly very bad mismanagement on the part of the professional staff. And part of it simply was that we had never really been paying attention, frankly, to whether the revenues could support the program. So once we got through that, which was really very scary. Mm -hmm. It sort of all retrenched a little bit and then slowly began to grow again. Now there is, again, paid staff, and, but on a much more stable level. And it's a very healthy organization now. Yeah. And the Institute is still just wonderful. <coughs> um, the Institute, um, among other things, became an important forum for discussing feminist perspectives. Correct. Particularly in the 80s. Also correct. Um, 
What's your perspective on this issue and okay. um, the so-called gender wars? Right, 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 right. Um, the Institute began to attract... Uh, this is my partisan description of what happened. Yes. Um, so which I, early on, in the first year or so, um, before we sort of move into this, obviously this was a much broader movement at this point. Correct. Uh, you were drawing on a much larger group. Was right. it the first three cover row? Who, who was part of this uh, Summer Institute at that point? And even the... the, uh, the it, it was partly... It was partly just people who had become regular attendees at the Institute. That was just their thing to do. There was not yet Pnei Or. There was not yet any of the other organizations which have since well, this is a nastier word that I mean, siphoned off some of that radical energy so that the Chavra Institute as such became a somewhat more mainstream thing. But in the 80s, all of that turmoil was within the framework of the Institute. And there were women pushing that the Institute commit itself to a much more radical feminist view of its own purposes and its own program. Um, and it led to, you know, the, there were these groups of women who went around finding things to disapprove of that were going on at the Institute. I called them, taking the phrase from the French Revolution, the Committee of Public Safety. Um, what kinds of things would they point Well, I'll tell you some stories. Please. In the 1985, Institute at Brandeis? I think so, but you know, it's plus or minus a year and it doesn't matter. There was a newly married couple who attended the Institute and very excited to be there. Yes, the story I wanted to tell you. So in the 1985 Institute, I think, um, there was this young couple who had just been married and at the very first night of the Institute, a bunch of their friends and also some strangers who just wanted to join the moment, did Sheva brachas for them. And the Committee of Public Safety came over and said, that is disgusting. This institute should not be the venue where we celebrate a patriarchal institution. And they went home. And they just went home. So that kind of captures it. And uh, it was terrible to watch. It was, it was the organization tearing itself apart. And then eventually it pulled itself back from the cliff. Do you have other examples of the tensions that the sort of well, issues around gender... Issues around gender, issues around what are the rules for deciding what kind of minion can take place and what kind of minion can take place, right? Can a mechitza minion take place? If there are enough people there who want it, then do all the work themselves. Can it take place? If it takes place, can it be in the program? If it can't be in the program, can at least a little notice be tacked up on some bulletin board somewhere? All of these things became fiercely debated issues. And the debate was not peaceful. The debate was lacerated with, with fury. And it was terrible to be there. On the other hand, an all-women's minion was perfectly fine. Um, Is there any sense in which you think, looking back, given the revolutionary nature of what Jewish feminism was really about, as it was struggling... As it was finding its own way, yeah. Finding its way, but it's also struggling to come to grips with what genuine egalitarianism mm -hmm. actually meant mm -hmm. that you think that it was inevitable in a sense. Oh gosh, inevitable was a very strong word. Uh, there is a sense in which it is unsurprising that the organization had to go through this very difficult period. But I'm not sure that it was inevitable because I would say that there were people there whose intentions for the organization were not altogether benevolent. Yeah. In what sense? Can you say Who were willing to bring the organization down if it didn't live up to their standards. I see. Um, 
Some of those people then wandered off to the Jewish renewal world. Um, and others just backed away because the organization was really too important for that. Backed away from these conflicts. From these confrontations. Um, of course, some of them still attend. Not all, but some of them still attend. Um, and as I'm sure you've learned from your interviews, talk about these things now with a different kind of distance and, and, and awareness of what it was like at the time. Uh, but how, how did the, the, the Institute and uh, the, the bodies that sort of managed this whole process uh, help the organization as a whole get through it, help the Institute oh. get through it all? Why, why did it survive? It survived, oh, it survived, I think, because too many people sensed its value, because a number of the people who were the most in, uh, uncompromising just <coughs> gave up on the organization and left. Um, when you say the organization, we're talking about the Institute, the National Havara Committee was essentially at this point just like a, what do they call a shell corporation, managing the institute. Um, I think those are the reasons, you know. It, it, were there were there ways of managing um, these kinds of discussions or making decisions that evolved uh, that helped? One of the, one of the program items that came up during those years at some institutes, maybe not every single year, um, was the question, how does an organization in which there is disagreement decide to handle that disagreement? Exactly. So there were people thinking about this. Um, the, the, the people who overtly, explicitly thought about this were not very many. But some of them just, you know, provided a kind of ballast as the thing went on. Um, and so, you know, it got through. The 90s were much quieter, much, 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 much quieter. And then in the late 90s, I stopped going because my kids were old enough to go to Camp Ramah, but I couldn't afford to send them there. So I worked there. Um, and I couldn't do both. The, the timing of it was just not okay. Once I stopped going to Camp Ramah because my kids were no longer going there, I, we have, now Nina and I, have begun finding our way back to the Institute. Yeah. You're, you're, you're actually mentioning something that is somewhat fascinating, which is that many, many of the original founders um, and found, founding members of the early Temple Road <coughs> Excuse me. Went several times to somewhat consistently for the first few years of the summer institutes, and eventually stopped. Stopped. Right. Do you have any theories about why well, why that would be so? Well, in my case, it's pretty clear why that was so. Yeah. I can't generalize from my case to others. It might be that people got tired. It might be that certain people began to have other opportunities to play similar roles in different venues. Pnei Or, uh, Alpha, you know, I mean, I mean <coughs> Aleph. Um, so their need for the Institute was a little less narrowly focused. And you know, you get to see the world. The Institute, when all is said and done, is only what it is, you know, and to, for that to be your main such activity, every year for 30 years um, requires a certain amount of determination. Every, every now and then, um, starting, let's see, so I stopped going to Camp Rama in 2006, I think, and every now and then since then, a whole bunch of the old timers would get in touch with each other and say, hey, let's all go back. And it happened once, I think in 2009, and since then, a number of us have been going back somewhat less regularly or in a coordinated way. 
Um, but we've, yeah, we've tried that because, you know, at this point, even those of us who are on other sides of the gender wars back then, at this point, you know, we go back a long way and we can be a little more relaxed about it. Yeah. Did you, um, you and, and your wife, Nina, um, belong to other Havarot over, the, over time? Ah, uh, I belonged to Minyan Ra'at. When was that? <sighs> Off and on since it was founded. Um, but you know, when I wasn't living on the Upper West Side, so that just means when I went into the city for a Shabbat, that's where I tended to go. Nina belonged for a long time to the West Side Minyan, both of which meet on Anshei Chesed. The West Side Minyan is much looser and, and more experimental and, I use this word with all due respect, flakier than Minyan Ma'at, which is in certain respects unbelievably stodgy and self-important. You may want to edit that out of the tape, but meanwhile I've said it. Um, um, right, so we never belonged to another Chavura because we never otherwise lived in a place where there was such a thing. When we lived in Queens, and this was true both when I lived with Judith and when I lived with Nina, um, the shuls were all very boring, Queensy synagogues. So I got to go to one, and Nina often didn't go to any. Um, I wanted to take Alex to shul, and I could read the Torah there sometimes, which made me feel useful. And then we moved to Long Island, where for reasons that continue to fascinate me, we almost at once joined the local Orthodox synagogue. This had a lot to do with the charismatic rabbi who was there, who over 20 years became a dear friend. You belonged to that synagogue for 20 years? Yeah, we joined it almost at once. We lived in Rosen for 22 and a half years. Um, uh, Noam knows the family of this rabbi. Um, why did we join that shul? I'll tell you why. We moved to Roslyn because, well, other names that you probably know, Joy Levert and Lee Friedlander told us, come live in Roslyn. You can live within walking distance of a reform and a reconstruction or a conservative and an orthodox shul, and you'll decide what you like. And they became friends too. So we, we moved to Roslyn. On the very first Shabbat, we had a three-week-old baby. So I went to shul and Nina stayed home with the two kids. And I walked into this orthodox shul, which I went to for the simple reason that it was the closest. And this rabbi had never seen me before in his life. You know, in the orthodox world, that's not how you do it. Before you move to a community, first you spend Shabbos there and you see whether you like the shul. I hadn't done any of that. I just moved there. And he just never let go of me. And he was very good at it, and he was completely genuine. And he knew that we are not and will not be Orthodox Jews, but we, we were polite. We, on the premises, we behaved properly. And again, over the years, I became very useful there. You know, I became a kind of associate rabbi, never with rabbinic authority, but with much teaching opportunity. And I was the Balkari there for many, many years, and we just made many, many, many friends there. Whereas the other synagogues were all bigger and much more suburban-y. So this was the synagogue that your kids grew up in here? Yes, and which they hated, it turns out. Because it was much too, and I see this now, very narrow, very confining, very dull. Um, and to us it was none of the above. Because, you know, we were adults. We didn't have to be confined by its confiningness. Um, but it was very insular, very... All the things that I could say by way of criticizing modern orthodoxy, I could say about that shul, but I won't. Okay. Um, and they ran away from it as soon as they went to college. So here you are in this orthodox shul, and then what happened once you retired and moved to Princeton? Ah. Oh, some of this is awkward for the public record. 
We thought we would go to the local synagogue. There is one synagogue in town. It's basically around the corner. Well, to be blunt but brief, it is very thin. It is boring. It has. It's run by a bunch of you know kind of right wing businessmen. And we very quickly saw that there's no there there for us. Whereas there's a very small egalitarian minion that meets on campus on Saturday mornings. The, con the non-Orthodox students don't attend because non-Orthodox students have enough Shabbat on Friday night and they sleep. Or well, whatever they do, I don't know what they do. Uh, so that, as I say it to people, when Nina and I walk into that minion, we don't change the average age in the room. Um, but and lovely, 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 lovely people. The kinds of people who 40 years ago would have loved the Havara Institute. And we have a little world there, you know. We do have 60-style Torah discussions, and we, we do it all ourselves, and there's no rabbi in charge. And nobody even knows what we do. It, is it connected to Rochelle? No, it's connected to the Center for Jewish Life. Center for Jewish Life which is the f at Princeton, which is the formal sort of holding corporation of Hillel. And it meets on those premises. And it's recognized as one of the things that goes on in the building. Is it mainly um, a, a, a non-student minion? Or, or is Our it minion is almost entirely non-student minion. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of each academic year, a couple of freshmen wander in, and by November, we've stopped seeing them. Every now and then, a graduate student couple come in, and they last a little longer, but then they have a baby, and, that's, and so much for that. Every now and then, visiting faculty come in, and they last for the year, and then they're gone. So we're basically ourselves, and we're an aging group, and the number of people in that group, as we're sitting here now, with really serious disease, is very high. So the future of this minion is not so secure. What's the age span, would you say, of people? I would say the youngest people there are in their 60s and the oldest people there are in their late 80s. In this minion and in general in your life, what would you say have been and are the enduring aspects of the original Havara vision and experience that have continued to be meaningful okay, to you? Okay, what I like about... what. what the, com the, the settings in which I have always felt happiest, and ironically, this Orthodox shul in Roslyn is an interesting exception to this. The settings in which I have always been happiest are the settings that at the beginning of our conversation I called my template. You know, a small group of people making their own way, forming their own group, making sure that the group is, is, is sustainable, and doing things as they have decided to do them. Um, and that's been true every time. And to me, that was real Jewish life. What I couldn't abide was sitting in some very large auditorium with a rabbi somewhere up there, telling everybody else how to be Jewish, knowing that they weren't listening. Some of my best friends over the years have been conservative rabbis who spent their careers doing that. And so good luck to them, but I couldn't have been, I couldn't have made it like that. Um, whereas all these groups, each in its turn, one of the things that I don't do very well is keep the friendships from one stage of my life to the next. It's too easy for me to make friends. So I just start up again and pretty soon I'm off, you know, I'm chugging along. Um, but all of these groups have been like that. When I was in my 20s, there were people in their 20s. Now I'm 74, it's people in their 70s. And, and we just do it. And a few of us are a little more central to the group than the others. So if a decision has to be made, a whole flurry of emails goes around. And soon a decision will have been made. Somebody decides every Sunday or Monday at the latest, all right, who's going to read the Torah this Shabbos? And it just gets done. Someone else brings Kiddush, someone else prepares the Haftarah, someone else prepares the Torah discussion. One member of the group is in charge of maintaining the calendar in which all these slots are filled. 
ideally for the next couple of months, sometimes not so well. Um, and as long as our health holds out, it's, we've got to, it's exactly the way I've always wanted to live. Um, are there ways in which um, you would say that your Jewish life, as you're describing it here, and ideas about spirituality, observance, etc., diverge significantly from um, what you thought during those early Chavarai years? Yes. I think about this a lot, actually. When I lived in Roslyn, although we belonged to this Orthodox shul, we had many, many friends in the big conservative shul, where the rabbi also became a very dear friend, but which was 20 minutes further walk. And, and you know, being in that room was not any better than being in the room where we went. Um, in that crowd of conservative Jews, most of whom were not really observant, Observance carried valence. It was respected. When they talked to people like Nina and me, they were a little bit apologetic. And I don't mean that by way of lording over them. I'm just setting a tone. In Roslyn, there's none of that. The ethos of the Roslyn Jewish community, including the parts of it in which our most important social networks are, does not include the valence of observance. So in our minion, for example, of an average attendance of maybe 15, really no more than five, keep Shabbos. The rest, like our minion, they come on Saturday morning, then they go and do what they do. And very often at Kiddush, we have a lovely Kiddush, one of them will say, want to go out for coffee after this? Sure. So, you know, that's a little frustrating. It's a little frustrating for you. Yeah, because I want, you know, I am, I am always envisioned belonging to a community in which more or less, that's what you'd like your community to be, in which more or less my, my um, core commitments were shared by the other people. And my core commitment to observance, to kashrut, to Shabbat, is simply not the norm here. It's not expected. And there is no deficit in just not sharing it. They're all respectful of us, but that's just you know interpersonal stuff. It's not really... Right. There's no expectation. There's no expectation of it. There's no sense that maybe we should be a personal model to others in this respect. Right? right? Sometimes they don't come to the Minion because they're going to Philadelphia for some reason. Sometimes this, sometimes that. Um, Is that... Does that feel for you personally consistent with the way you felt since the beginning of your involvement years No, back? because in the past, at the, very, at the very least, I was able to convince myself that in fact more people did share those commitments. So that in, in the earlier occurrences of my template, I was able to convince myself that a much higher percentage of the people whom I encountered, in the, and also outside of that, in Montreal, I couldn't find a shul I liked, but I found many, many Jews who were my kind of people. And they were happy with the shuls, and I was not, so that, that was all fine. Um, I may have been wrong, because I was also very naive about these things. I was finding my own way into observance, and I just talked myself, to some degree, into believing the whole world is doing this with me. When I was a student at JTS, one of my friends on the, in the student body said, you know, no more than half the guys who live in the storm dolphin every morning. Huh. And I, I don't know whether that was correct, but the idea that might even be correct enough that he would say it was just shocking to me. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when I began to see that the, uh, in the leadership of the National Chavra Committee and the Chavra Institute, a lot of deeply involved people were in fact not observant. That created a kind of cognitive dissonance for me, which I got used to. But it never occurred to me that you would want to be a leader of something like that. You know, one member of the board one year said to me, I love coming to board meetings because then on Saturday afternoon I can go shopping. She lived in out of town. 
But this was her, you know, the board didn't meet on Shabbos, but she came for the weekend. And on Saturday afternoon, she went shopping. And then on Sunday, the board met. So the idea, again, that a person would say that and not sense, it's all right if I do that, but maybe I shouldn't let the whole world know that I'm, that, that required a sort of recalibration of my conception of things. I got used to it. Because even in this Orthodox synagogue, not everybody was Orthodox. Yeah. Are there ways that your, your own ideas for yourself changed over this time? Uh, over the years, I've alluded to this before when I quoted my mother's line about guilt. Yes. Over the years, my own halachic norms have come and gone. In the course, when we lived in Montreal, where there's a lot of really good eating. Very quickly, you know, the, we kept a kosher apartment, but I just stopped wondering about what I ate out. I didn't eat shellfish, I didn't eat pork, but I ate. Um, and then we moved to New York, and then I met Nina, you know, who had always kept kosher, so she brought me back into the comfort well realm. My career as a regular davener also had starts and stops. Uh, partly under the influence of the Orthodox synagogue and partly because there were times in my life that I sensed some kind of intrinsic meaning in it. I actually davened very regularly and not just in the morning. And it was part of my way of just measuring the progress of time and focusing in on the kinds of things that the Siddur presumably wants you to focus in on. And it was very good for me. And then I just stopped seeing these things in the act of dominating that I had previously seen. And I let it drift away. Um, so it comes and goes. And... And you, as you said, don't feel any guilt. I feel no guilt about it at all. I feel some nostalgia. Because some of those earlier periods of my life, were, these things were very important and very nice to have in my life. But then I just couldn't have them anymore because it was too artificial and too unreal. Um, so I let them go. You know, I'm, I'm not going to hold on to something because my mother was afraid I'd feel guilty. Um, and I keep thinking, I know this is only a fantasy. <clears throat> One of these days, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll go find where my children are. But if it hasn't happened in all these years, the odds that it's going to happen tomorrow are very slender. You've spent your career as a professor of yes. Jewish studies, um, mainly at the bulk of those years at Stony Brook, Correct. Right? Um, with a f focus on Judaism in, in late antiquity? Well, no. Uh, the program is much too small for that. I was just doing almost all the undergraduate teaching in Jewish studies oh, that there was. Mm -hmm. So I taught, all, I taught a, you know, a full year uh, <coughs> survey of Jewish history. I taught an introduction to great Jewish books, most of which were not ancient books. I taught a course on Zionism, because I felt somebody needed to teach a course on Zionism. So I did it. I taught some courses not in Jewish studies. It was in the religious studies program at Stony Brook had no one who taught Judaism because there were a whole series of very complicated administrative accidents. The Jewish studies program, which is where I was, supplied the Judaic studies courses for the religious studies program. Which was fine, but once I was also a courtesy member of the religious studies department, over the years I taught, every now and then I taught the survey of world religions, and every now and then I taught the sort of the, the, the course for majors and minors, the history of religious studies as a field, all of which I enjoy teaching, but which is not Jewish studies. And then at a certain point I m moved into the history department. And the price that I paid, price is the wrong word because I didn't mind paying it at all. History department had no one teaching Greek or Roman history, which is like a shanda. So I said, all right, I'll teach Greek and Roman history too. 
So, you know, I was teaching, therefore, that much less Jewish studies. And the department was fine with me. Every semester, I told the department secretary, um, all right, next semester I have to teach this course in religious studies, but I'll try to teach one course in Jewish studies, but I may not be able to teach a course in history next semester. And we all worked it out. You know, they were very good to me. They were very good to me. Um, and I just balanced all these three different venues, really. Any way I wanted to, because nobody was really telling me, no, 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 you can't do that. We need you to do this. Um, yeah, I forget. That was an answer to your question, but I'm, I'm not a No, it, it was, basically. Broadly speaking, do you see a relationship between um, involvement in one of the early Chavah wrote and um, career path? or, or Ah, it certainly is true that many of the most active of the earliest membership of the New York Havara became Jewish studies academics. There's a quite a substantial list of those people. Yes. Um, I can't think of her bringing, there was a smaller handful of people like that at Havara Shalom also. Or became Jewish professionals like Eddie Feld. Um, But I saw my membership in the Chavura as what I did with my private time because it was my community. You know, you work, you have a job, you do it well, you do it responsibly, you do it because I was very lucky. I always enjoyed the way I could earn a living. Yes. But you do come home from work, you know, and you know it's clear now in retrospect, of course, that I was doing exactly the same sorts of thing in the classroom and in the Chavura. Of course, that was the kind of thing I did well and enjoyed doing, and there were these two different venues in which I could do it. But no, I didn't see either of those as guiding me toward the other. In part because, really, despite what I just said, it's not like a voting majority of the Chavura were academics. Mm -hmm. um, So, it doesn't have to be academics. I mean, you're, you, you chose academics. The others no, right, right, right. Chose. I don't think so. I don't think so. I know Beth Friedman Shamgar, you know, who went off and became a Schubert specialist at Bar Ilan. Um, she didn't join the Chavura because she wanted a place to talk about Beethoven symphonies. But once she was in the Chavura, that's what she had to talk about. So she talked about it. Um, <clears throat> in that sense, the Chavura is such... I think essentially drew people in who liked what they found there without necessarily having a pre-existing sense this is what I'm looking for. Our minion here at, at, in Princeton again you know these some of them are, are university people some retired some not retired but at least half the membership are not university people at all but they wandered in one day and they liked it and they've become very active members of this very small group. Yeah. Um, just want to spend one minute looking back and asking you to assess what you see as the New York Havara's greatest successes and its most important challenges. Okay. Its greatest successes in retrospect <clears throat> are the friendships that it nurtured which, after all, flourish decades after the Chavara as an organized programming activity, disappeared. Okay. Um, the number of us who would say that our most important friendships are one another is not trivial. Um, its greatest failing, which may be part of what brought it down, was the whole makers and takers thing. Eventually, we had a large followership who were just consumers. And I think that put a certain strain um, on the organization. Do you still, con do you, did you then, do you, and do you still, if so, consider yourself a Chabarad Jew? Oh, people ask me that all the time. And, yeah. You know, why would they ask you that? 
Uh, well, you're, you mean? No, because they know of my history. Okay. And, you know, the part of the problem, I have no idea what a Chavra Jew is. So that makes it easier to fend off the question. When I lived in, on Long Island, you know, I belonged to an Orthodox synagogue. My background was all in the conservative movement, for which I had almost nothing nice to say. And I had this long history in the Chavra movement. So, so who was I? And the only answer I could give people was to repeat what I just said to you. There's all that. Am I a Chavra Jew? There's a sense in which my sense of an ideal Jewish community is still what the Chavra aspired to. You know, you know, I'll repeat it. A small group of people living lives that they have constructed with one another in some engagement with the outside world, but in the engagement of their own choosing. Um, right. The risk of that, of course, is a kind of elitist disdain for the outside world, which I've, of which I have seen plenty. But it doesn't have to be like that. That's not inevitable. So that's still how, you know, that's how I would like to be living my life. And in a sense, I have that here in Princeton, except it's not quite as, as, as organizationally defined as the New York Havre Hours. There's no group that I belong to here which fits that description, except maybe this minion. But on, on, on Thursday mornings, I have a study group, which are Havre people. On Wednesday at lunchtime, I have a different study group, which are Havara people. On, you know, on Tuesday and Friday mornings, I have one-on-one -on -one study groups, both as it happens with conservative rabbis. So I get around. Um, <clears throat> and What are the topics of those two study groups? Um, the Thursday morning, he thought was Dafyomi. It's actually, we're, we've been working our way through Breshit Rabbah. And, you know, first we schmooze for half the time, and then we read three sentences and we talk about those three sentences for a while, and maybe we read another three sentences, maybe not. The Wednesday group <clears throat> has a little more of the makers and takers problem as well. Wednesday mornings, you know, so there, <clears throat> there seems to be a commitment that we should be studying a Talmudic text, but one of the other Chavra Institute people and I choose what they're going to be and most of the other people are just happy with whatever we put in front of them. And we work out of the Art Scroll Talmud simply because the translation is serviceable and the notes are sometimes useful, though a lot of them are just mind-bogglingly yeshivish. Um, and there, you know, a, a smaller subset of the group is carrying the group. But there are also in the group two retired conservative Rebbitsons who live in Princeton. So it's not like nobody in the group has anything of their own to, 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 to supply. <clears throat> it's just that some of the people in the group are very grateful for the fact that the group is being made possible for them by other people. And I don't resent that. It's fine with me. It's just that in the case of the Chavra, the proportions became different. There were like <clears throat> maybe a dozen and a half people carrying 50. And so on Rosh Hashanah, there were all these strangers in the room who had really no idea what was going on. Someone had to announce pages, which to my mind immediately kills whatever was going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, finally, we were starting to... Um, discuss earlier the <coughs> proliferation of Chavarot yes. in synagogues. Yes, right. Um, and I wanted to come back to that. Sure. Do you, how do you see those Chavarot in relationship oh, to the independent... Part of the work, going back to your question, am I a Chavarot Jew, is that the proliferation of those groups has entailed a kind of explosion in the meaning of the word Chavarot. So now it me any group that designates a chavara designates itself a chavara. No, it's a chavara. So some of them, and I've experienced maybe half a dozen of them up close off all the years, some of them actually are the people with some real Jewish background in the group who find the grown-up synagogue where the rabbi is spoon-feeding everything to everybody just unsatisfying. 
So they go off and make a minion, you know, which is, again, traditional davening, but they do their own laning, and they do their own this, and they do their own that. When the rabbi is supportive of this, when the rabbi doesn't see it as threatening, it's a wonderful enrichment in the life of the community as a whole. And if it's not what you know, would have been called a chavara in the 1960s, let it be called a chavara. Because again, in its own way, it's a group of people finding their own way, this time in, within the venue of an organized synagogue co- congregation, and doing what they want to do. Here in Princeton, there's a chavura type minion that meets at the Jewish center, but separately. And again, they're sort of grandfathered in. I don't know, you know, the, the rabbinic pulpit here has been a little bit of a revolving door over the years. And I gather that some of the rabbis in the past were not very happy about this. They see it as a threat. That's always the problem with these groups. Um, but the current rabbi is perfectly happy with it, so they meet. There's a different group, which I think largely overlaps with that, that calls itself the Chavura. But I think it is more a social group and a, and a learning and discussion group that doesn't have a Shabbat program. I'd be wrong about that. We don't belong to that group at all. There's just a limit to how many groups you can belong to. What, what do you see as the relationship, if any, between the Chavura, the original Chavurot and others in yeah. its legacy and independent Minyanim of today? Ah. Uh, independent Minyanim of today, that's a very good question. Independent Minyanim of today are in some way the same impulse one generation later, having adapted to the fact that it's no longer the mid-20th century, it's the early 21st century. I believe, this may be factually incorrect, I have not studied it, that a lot of the independent minyanim tend to attract people who, like the original members of the Chavarot, can carry the load. I mean, Alex, my son, belongs to Altshul, which can have, you know, dozens and dozens of people on a Shabbos. But there are plenty of them who can lay in, and plenty of them who could lead tefillah, and plenty of them who can give a Dvar Torah, several of whom are Jewish professionals, at least some of whom are rabbis and Jewish professionals. Um, and it's lovely. But, you know, it doesn't have the same impetus to social action. A lot of them do as individuals. It doesn't meet every week. Alex got involved, frankly, because he had a little girl growing up and he wanted to give her some such experience. Um, but now he's very involved. He's in, you know, in the leadership cadre, especially of the children's program. <clears throat> so that's how, you know, it works like that. So uh, in Manhattan, the Upper West Side, is, is peppered with these groups, about which I know actually shockingly little. Um, and in, you know, the Germantown Jewish Center in Philadelphia, there are, there are three regular tefillot. There's the one in the main sanctuary, which is rabbi-led. There's a more right-wing one and a more left-wing one. The more left-wing one is really an offshoot of, of the RRC, but it meets there. Um, and they all coexist. And every now and then they get together for a joint kiddush or whatever. But um, they all coexist. In Anche Chesed, in addition to the main sanctuary, there are at least two that meet every week. And I don't know how many meet, not every week. So, looking back over this past <clears throat> half century of the evolution of the Hamara in American Jewish life, what role, if any, do you see for um, the Hamara in 21st century Judaism? You mean the Hamara in its original sense? In, in the, in, are con- it's an evolving... There are, oh, there, are, there are going to continue to be groups like this because there are enough people who want and need and demand this kind of Jewish environment, who don't want to have anything spoon-fed to them, especially from someone from whom they are not otherwise inclined to have much respect. Um... They want to find kindred people with whom they can desire, not desire, design the things that they want to do. 
That's now an impulse that is hard-baked into American Jewish life. And the Chavara movement of the 60s and early 70s, in certain respects, triggered it. Um, and there are still some remnants of the original Chavarot, which are continuing to do their thing. They look to me a little bit like vestigial, but that may be unfair of me because the one that I belong to is by far the most vestigial of them all. And Fabrengen and Chavrat Shalom do seem more functional still than that. Um, but all over the place there are these groups of people who are just doing their thing. And I think what the, Chavra, the early Chavra movement, what it did, was to give permission for that and to lay down a couple of guidelines, guidelines is even too strong, just some suggestions as to how it might best be done. Um, and the models are still there. And by now, you know, the, from the early 70s to the mid-teens, there was even an intermediate generation which, you know, did whatever it did. Um, so these groups, you know, exist. Some of them will fade. Some of them become one generation groups. Our minion here in Princeton shows alarming signs of not having a successor generation to take it over. The Chavra Institute is a flamboyant success at this. Um, so, you know, it's hard to predict what it's all going to look like, but the Chavra movement in its... and especially once it stopped having disdain for the unwashed masses and began to see that the unwashed masses, among them are people who are looking for what we looked for, but maybe aren't quite able to find it on their own. So, you know, and a lot of us also, we moved out, we, you know, I, I moved to all kinds of places. In some of those places, it became possible to be the catalyst of the formation of such a group. And right in, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. This has been wonderful to talk about.